Milton's Minor Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Front Matter Part 1. Preface by the Reverend H. C. Beeching, M.A. This edition of Milton's Poetry is a reprint, as careful as editor and printers have been able to make it, from the earliest printed copies of the several poems. First, the 1645 volume of the minor poems has been printed entire. Then follow in order the poems added in the reissue of 1673, The Paradise Lost, from the edition of 1667, and The Paradise Regained and Samson Agonistes from the edition of 1671. The most interesting portion of the book must be reckoned the first section of it, which reproduces for the first time the scarce small octavo of 1645. The only reprint of the minor poems in the old spelling, so far as I know, is the one edited by Mitford, but that followed the edition of 1673, which is comparatively uninteresting, since it could not have had Milton's oversight as it passed through the press. We know that it was set up from a copy of the 1645 edition because it reproduces some pointless eccentricities, such as the varying form of the chorus in Psalm 136. But while it corrects the errata tabulated in that edition, it commits many more blunders of its own. It is valuable, however, as the editio princeps of ten of the sonnets, and it contains one important alteration in the Ode on the Nativity. This and all other alterations will be found noted where they occur. I have not thought it necessary to note mere differences of spelling between the two editions, but a word may find place here upon their general character. Generally, it may be said, that where the two editions differ, the later spelling is that now in use. Thus, words like goddess, darkness, usually written in the first edition with one final s, have two, while on the other hand, words like vernal, youthful, and monosyllables like hug, far, lose their double letter. Many monosyllables, for example, some, s-o-m, course, c-o-u-r-s, glimpse, g-l-i-m-p-s, where, W-H-E-R, verse, V-E-R-S, aw, A-W, else, E-L-S, done, D-O-N, I, E-Y, lie, L-Y. So written in 1645, take on in 1673, an E mute, while words like harp, H-A-R-P-E, winds, W-I-N-D-E-S, only O-N-E-L-Y, lose it. By a reciprocal change, air, A-Y-R, and cypress, C-I-P-R-E-S-S, -S, become air, A-I-R, and cypress, C-Y-P-R-E-S-S. -S. And the vowels in Dane, D-A-I-G-N, veil, V-A-I-L, near, N-E-E-R, believe, B-E-L-E-E-V-E, -E -E, shield, S-H-E-I-L-D, bosom, B-O-O-S-O-M, even, E-E-V-E-N, Battle, B A T T A I L, Traveler, T R A V A I L E R, and many other words are similarly modernized. On the other hand, there are a few cases where the 1645 edition exhibits the spelling which has succeeded in fixing itself, as travail, 1673, travel, in the sense of labor, and robed, R O B apostrophe D, Profane, P-R-O-P-H-A-N-E, Human, H-U-M-A-N-E, Flood, F-L-O-U-D, and Bloody, B-L-O-U-D-Y, Forest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T, Triple, T-R-I-P-P-L-E, Alas, A-L-A-S-S, and Huddling, H-U-D-L-I-N-G. Indeed, the spelling in this later edition is not untouched by 17th century inconsistency. It retains here and there forms like shameless with one s, caterous with one s, where 1645 reads caterous with two s's, and occasionally reverts to the older-fashioned spelling of monosyllables without the mute e. In the epitaph on the Marchioness of Winchester, it reads, quote, and some, s-o-m, flowers and some bays, s-o-m-e, 
but undoubtedly the impression on the whole is of a much more modern text. In the matter of small or capital letters, I have followed the old copy, except in one or two places where a personification seemed not plainly enough marked to a modern reader without a capital. Thus in Il Penseroso, line 49, I print Leisure, L-E-A-S-U-R-E with a capital L, although both editions read Leisure with a small L. And in the vacation exercise, line 71, times with a capital T for times with a small t. Also, where the employment or omission of a capital is plainly due to misprinting, as too frequently in the 1673 edition, I silently make the correction. Examples are notes with a small n for notes with a capital in sonnet 17, line 13, anointed with a capital A for anointed with a small a, in Psalm 2, line 12. In regard to punctuation, I have followed the old printers, except in obvious misprints, and followed them also as far as possible in their distribution of Roman and Italic type, and in the grouping of words and lines in the various titles. To follow them exactly was impossible, as the books are so very different in size. At this point, the candid reader may perhaps ask what advantage is gained by presenting these poems to modern readers in the dress of a bygone age. If the question were put to me, I should probably evade it by pointing out that Mr. Froud is issuing an edition based upon this, in which the spelling is frankly that of today. But if the question were pressed, I think a sufficient answer might be found. To begin with, I should point out that even Professor Masson, who in his excellent edition argues the point and decides in favor of modern spelling, allows that there are peculiarities of Milton's spelling which are really significant and ought therefore to be noted or preserved. But who is to determine exactly which words are spelled according to the poet's own instructions and which according to the printer's whim? It is notorious that in Paradise Lost, some words were spelt upon a deliberate system, and it may very well happen that in the volume of minor poems which the poet saw through the press in 1645, there were spellings no less systematic. Professor Masson makes a great point of the fact that Milton's own spelling, exhibited in the autograph manuscript of some of the minor poems preserved in Trinity College, Cambridge, does not correspond with that of the printed copy. Note, this manuscript invaluable to all students of Milton, has lately been facsimilate under the superintendence of Dr. Aldous Wright and published at the Cambridge University Press. This is certainly true, as the reader may see for himself by comparing the passage from the manuscript given in the appendix with the corresponding place in the text. Milton's own spelling revels in redundant ease, while the printer of the 1645 book is very sparing of but in cases where the spelling affects the meter, we find that the printed text and Milton's manuscript closely correspond, and it is upon its value in determining the meter, quite as much as its antiquarian interest, that I should base the justification of this reprint. Take, for instance, such a line as the 11th of Comus, which Professor Masson gives us as amongst the enthroned gods on sainted seats. A reader not learned in Miltonic rhythms will certainly read this, amongst then-throned gods. But the 1645 edition reads, amongst the enthroned gods. And so does Milton's manuscript. Again, in line 597, Professor Masson reads, It shall be in eternal, restless change, self-fed and self-consumed. If this fail, the pillared firmament is rottenness, etc. But, the 1645 text and Milton's manuscript read self-consumed, M apostrophe D, after which word there is to be understood a metrical pause to mark the violent transition of the thought. Self-fed and self-consumed, if this fail. Again, in the second line of the sonnet to a nightingale, Professor Masson has warblest at eve when all the woods are still. But the early edition, which probably follows Milton's spelling, though in this case we have no manuscript to compare, reads Warblest, B-L apostrophe S-T. So the original text of Samson, line 670, has T 
Tempest, T-E-M-P-E-R, apostrophe S-T. The retention of the old system of punctuation may be less defensible, but I have retained it because it may now and then be of use in determining a point of syntax. The absence of a comma, for example, after the word hearse in the 58th line of the epitaph on the Marchioness of Winchester, printed by Professor Masson, thus, and some flowers and some bays for thy hearse to strew the ways, no comma after bays. But in the 1645 edition, and some flowers and some bays for thy hearse to strew the ways with a comma after bays goes to prove that for here must be taken as apostrophe for before of the paradise lost there were two editions issued during milton's lifetime and while the first has been taken as our text all the variants in the second not being simple misprints have been recorded in the notes in one respect however in the distribution of the poem into twelve books instead of ten it has seemed best for the sake of practical convenience to follow the second edition a word may be allowed here on the famous correction among the errata prefixed to this edition lib two verse four one four for we w e read we w e e this correction shows not only that Milton had theories about spelling, but also that he found means, though his sight was gone, to ascertain whether his rules had been carried out by his printer. And in itself, this fact justifies the facsimile reprint. What the principle in the use of the double vowel actually was, and it is found to affect other monosyllabic pronouns, it is not so easy to discover, though roughly it is clear the reduplication was intended to mark emphasis. For example, in the speech of the Divine Son after the battle in heaven, book 6, lines 810 to 817, the pronouns which the voice would naturally emphasize are spelt with the double vowel. Stand only and behold God's indignation on these godless poured by me. Not you, but me they have despised, yet envied, Against me is all their rage, because the Father, to whom in heaven supreme kingdom and power and glory appertains, hath honoured me according to his will. Therefore to me their doom he hath assigned. Honoured me, M-E, to me, M-E-E, -E, their doom he hath assigned. In the Son's speech offering himself as Redeemer, Book 3, lines 227 to 249, where the pronoun all through is markedly emphasized, it is printed me with two e's the first four times and afterwards me with one e. But it is noticeable that these first four times the emphatic word does not stand in the stressed place of the verse, so that a careless reader might not emphasize it, unless his attention were specially led by some such sign. Behold me, then, me for him, Life for life I offer, on me let thine anger fall, account me man. In the Hymn of Creation, Book 5, lines 160 to 209, where ye occurs, y-e, 14 times, the emphasis and the metric stress six times out of seven coincide, and the pronoun is spelt ye, y-e-e. -E. Where it is unemphatic and in an unstressed place, it is spelled ye with one e. Two lines are especially instructive. Speak ye who best can tell, ye sons of light. Speak ye two e's, ye sons of light, one e. Line 160. And fountains, and ye that warble as ye flow. Melodious murmurs, warbling, tune his praise. Fountains, and ye two e's, as ye flow, one e. Line 195. In Book 5, line 694, it marks, as the voice, by its emphasis would mark in reading, a change of subject. So spake the false archangel, and infused bad influence into the unwary breast of his associate. He, the associate, together calls, etc., 
An examination of other passages where there is no antithesis goes to show that the length and form of the pronoun is most frequent before a pause, as Book 7, line 95, or at the end of a line, Book 1, lines 245 and 257, or when a foot is inverted, Book 5, line 133, or when as object it precedes its verb, Book 5, line 612, Book 7, line 747, or as subject follows it, Book 9, line 1109, Book 10, line 4. But as we might expect under circumstances where a purist could not correct his own proofs, there are not a few inconsistencies. There does not seem, for example, any special emphasis in the second we of the following passage. Freely we serve, because we freely love, as in our will to love or not. In this we stand or fall, the second we, because we freely love, as two e's. Book 5, line 538. On the other hand, in the passage, Book 3, line 41, in which the poet speaks of his own blindness, Thus with the year, seasons return, but not to me returns day, etc. Where, if anywhere, we should expect me with two e's, we do not find it, though it occurs in the speech eight lines below. It should be added that this differentiation of the pronoun is not found in any printed poem of Milton's before Paradise Lost, nor is it found in the Cambridge autograph. In that manuscript, the constant forms are me with one e, we with two e's, ye with two e's. There is one place where there is a difference in the spelling of she, and it is just possible that this may not be due to accident. In the first verse of the song in Arcades, the manuscript reads, This, this is she, S-H-E-E. -E. And in the third verse, This, this is she alone, she with one E. This use of the double vowel is found a few times in Paradise Regained. In Book 2, line 259, and Book 4, lines 486 and 497, where me, M-E-E, -E, begins a line, and in Book 4, line 638, where he, with two E's, is specially emphatic in the concluding lines of the poem. In Samson Agonistes, it is more frequent. For example, lines 124, 178, 193, 220, 252, 290, and 1125. Another word the spelling of which in Paradise Lost will be observed to vary is the pronoun there, which is spelt sometimes ther, T-H-I-R. The spelling in the Cambridge manuscript is uniformly T-H-I-R-E, except once when it is T-H-I-R, and where there T-H-I-R occurs once in the writing of an amanuensis, the E is struck through. That the difference is not merely a printer's device to accommodate his line may be seen by a comparison of lines 358 and 363 in the first book, where the shorter word comes in the shorter line. It is probable that the lighter form of the word was intended to be used when it was quite unemphatic. Contrast, for example, in book 3, line 59, his own works and their works at once to view, with line 113, their maker and their making and their fate. T-H-E-I-R in the first quotation, T-H-I-R three times in the second quotation. But the use is not consistent, and the form there is not found at all till the 349th line of the first book. The distinction is kept up in the Paradise Regained at Samson Agonistes, but if possible with even less consistency. Such passages, however, as Paradise Regained 3, 414 to 440, Samson Agonistes 880 to 890, are certainly spelt upon a method, and it is noticeable that in the choruses the lighter form is universal. Paradise Regained and Samson Agonistes were published in 1671, and no further edition was called for in the remaining three years of the poet's lifetime, so that in the case of these poems, there are no new readings to record. 
and the texts were so carefully revised that only one fault paradise regained book two line three o nine was left for correction later in these and the other poems i have corrected the misprints catalogued in the tables of errata and i have silently corrected any other unless it might be mistaken for a various reading when i have called attention to it in a note thus i have not recorded such blunders as lethian for lesbian in the 1645 text of lycidas line 63 or hollow for hollow in paradise lost book 6 line 4a4 but i have noted content for consent in at a solemn music line 6 in conclusion i have to offer my sincere thanks to all who have collaborated with me in preparing this edition to the delegates of the Oxford Press for allowing me to undertake it and decorate it with so many facsimiles, to the controller of the press for his unfailing courtesy, to the printers and printers' reader for their care and pains. Coming nearer home, I cannot but acknowledge the help I have received in looking over proof sheets from my sister, Mrs. P. A. Barnett, who has ungrudgingly put at the service of this book both time and eyesight. In taking leave of it, I may be permitted to say that it has cost more of both these inestimable treasures than I had anticipated. The last proof reaches me just a year after the first, and the progress of the work has not in the interval been interrupted. In tenui labor et tenuis gloria. Nevertheless, I cannot be sorry it was undertaken. H.C.B. Yattendon Rectory, November 8, 1899. End of preface. End of front matter, part one. Front matter, part two, to Milton's minor poems. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Transcriber's note. Facsimile of title page of 1645 edition follows. Poems of Mr. John Milton, both English and Latin composed at several times, printed by his true copies. The songs were set in music by Mr. Henry Laws, gentleman of the King's Chapel, and one of His Majesty's private music. Pacare frontem cingere ne voce nociat mala lingua futuro. Virgil, Eclogue 7. Printed and published according to order, London, printed by Ruth Rayworth for Humphrey Mosley and are to be sold at the sign of the Prince's Arms in St. Paul's Churchyard, 1645. Transcriber's Note Facsimile of title page of 1673 edition follows. Poems, etc., upon several occasions, by Mr. John Milton, both English and Latin, etc., composed at several times, with a small tractate of education to Mr. Hartley, London printed for Thomas Dring at the Blue Anchor next Mitre Court over against Fetter Lane in Fleet Street, 1673. The Stationer to the Reader It is not any private respect of gain, gentle reader, for the slightest pamphlet is nowadays more vendible than the works of learnedest men, but it is the love I have to our own language that hath made me diligent to collect and set forth such pieces, both in prose and verse, as may renew the wanted honour and esteem of our tongue. And it's the worth of these, both English and Latin poems, not the flourish of any prefixed encomiums, that can invite thee to buy them, though these are not without the highest commendations and applause of the learnedst academics, both domestic and foreign. And amongst those of our own country, the unparalleled attestation of that renowned provost of Eton, Sir Henry Wotton, I know not thy palate how it relishes such dainties, nor how harmonious thy soul is. Perhaps more trivial airs may please thee better. But howsoever thy opinion is spent upon these, that encouragement I have already received from the most ingenious men in their clear and courteous entertainment of Mr. Waller's late choice pieces, hath once more made me adventure into the world presenting it with these evergreen and not-to-be-blasted laurels. The author's more peculiar excellency in these studies was too well known to conceal his papers or to keep me from attempting to solicit them from him. 
let the event guide itself which way it will, I shall deserve of the age by bringing into the light as true a birth as the muses have brought forth since our famous Spencer wrote, whose poems, in these English ones, are as rarely imitated as sweetly excelled. Reader, if thou art eagle-eyed to censure their worth, I am not fearful to expose them to thy exactest perusal. Thine to command, Humphrey Mosley. End of Front Matter Part 2《On the Morning of Christ's Nativity by John Milton, composed 1629. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. This is the month, and this the happy morn, wherein the Son of Heaven's eternal King, of wedded maid and virgin mother born, our great redemption from above did bring. For so the holy sages once did sing that he our deadly forfeit should release, and with his father work us a perpetual peace. That glorious form, that light unsufferable, and that far-beaming blaze of majesty, wherewith he wont at heaven's high council table to sit the midst of trinal unity, he laid aside, and here with us to be forsook the courts of everlasting day, and chose with us a darksome house of mortal clay. Say, heavenly muse, shall not thy sacred vein afford a present to the infant God? Hast thou no verse, no hymn, or solemn strain to welcome him to this his new abode, now while the heaven by the sun's team untrod hath took no print of the approaching light, and all the spangled host keep watch in squadrons bright? See how from far upon the eastern road the star-led wizards haste with odour sweet. O oh, run, prevent them with thy humble ode, and lay it lowly at his blessed feet. Have thou the honour first, thy lord, to greet, and join thy voice unto the angel choir from out his secret altar, touched with hallowed fire. The Hymn It was the winter wild while the heaven-born child all meanly wrapped in the rude manger lies. Nature, in awe to him, had doffed her gaudy trim, with her great master so to sympathize. It was no season then for her to wanton with the sun, her lusty paramour. Only with speeches fair she wooed the gentle air to hide her guilty front with innocent snow, and on her naked shame pollute with sinful blame the saintly veil of maiden white to throw, confounded that her maker's eyes should look so near upon her foul deformities. But he, her fears to cease, sent down the meek-eyed peace. She, crowned with olive green, came softly sliding down through the turning sphere, his ready harbinger, with turtle wing the amorous clouds dividing, and waving wide her myrtle wand, she strikes a universal peace through sea and land. No war or battle sound was heard the world around. The idle spear and shield were high uphung. The hooked chariot stood unstained with hostile blood. The trumpet spake not to the armed throng, and kings sate still with awful eye, as if they surely knew their sovereign lord was by. But peaceful was the night, wherein the Prince of Light his reign of peace upon the earth began. The winds with wonder whist, smoothly the waters kissed, whispering new joys to the mild ocean, who now hath quite forgot to rave, while birds of calm sit brooding on the charmed wave. The stars with deep amaze stand fixed in steadfast gaze, bending one way their precious influence, and will not take their flight for all the morning light, or Lucifer that often warned them thence. But in their glimmering orbs did glow until their Lord himself bespake and bid them go. And though the shady gloom had given day her room, the sun himself withheld his wonted speed, 
and hid his head for shame as his inferior flame the new enlightened world no more should need he saw a greater sun appear than his bright throne or burning axle tree could bear the shepherds on the lawn or ere the point of dawn sate simply chatting in a rustic grove full little thought they then that the mighty pan was kindly come to live with them below perhaps their loves or else their sheep was all that did their silly thoughts so busy keep when such music sweet their hearts and ears did greet as never was by mortal finger struck divinely warbled voice answering the stringed noise as all their souls in blissful rapture took the air such pleasure loath to lose with thousand echoes still prolongs each heavenly close nature that heard such sound beneath the hollow round of cynthia's seat the airy region thrilling now was almost one to think her part was done and that her reign had here its last fulfilling she knew such harmony alone could hold all heaven and earth in happier union at last surrounds their sight a globe of circular light that with long beams the shame-faced night arrayed the helmed cherubim and sworded seraphim are seen in glittering ranks with wings displayed harping in loud and solemn choir with unexpressive notes to heaven's new-born air such music as to said before was never made but when of old the sons of morning sung while the creator great his constellations set and the well-balanced world on hinges hung and cast the dark foundations deep and bid the weltering waves their oozy channel keep ring out ye crystal spheres once bless our human ears if ye have power to touch our senses so and let your silver chime move in melodious time and let the bass of heaven's deep organ blow and with your ninefold harmony make up full consort to the angelic symphony for if such holy song enwrap our fancy long time will run back and fetch the age of gold and speckled vanity will sicken soon and die and leprous sin will melt from earthly mould and hell itself will pass away and leave her dolorous mansions to the peering day yea truth and justice then will down return to men the enamelled arras of the rainbow wearing and mercy set between throned in celestial sheen with radiant feet the tissued clouds down steering and heaven as at some festival will open wide the gates of her high palace hall but wisest fate says no this must not yet be so the babe lies yet in smiling infancy that on the bitter cross must redeem our loss so both himself and us to glorify yet first to those who chained in sleep the wakeful trump of doom must thunder through the deep with such a horrid clang as on mount sinai rang while the red fire and smouldering clouds outbreak the aged earth aghast with terror of that blast shall from the surface to the centre shake when at the world's last session the dreadful judge in middle air shall spread his throne and then at last our bliss full and perfect is but now begins for from this happy day though dragon underground in straighter limits bound not half so far casts his usurped sway and wroth to see his kingdom fail swinges the scaly horror of his folded tail the oracles are dumb no voice or hideous hum runs through the archered roof in words deceiving apollo from his shrine can no more divine with hollow shriek the steep of delphos leaving no nightly trance or breathed spell inspires the pale-eyed priest from the prophetic cell the lonely mountains o'er and the resounding shore 
a voice of weeping heard and loud lament from haunted spring and dale edged with poplar pale the parting genius is with sighing sent with flower in woven tresses torn the nymphs in twilight shade of tangled thickets mourn in consecrated earth and on the holy hearth the lars and lemmers moan with midnight plaint in urns and altars round a drear and dying sound affrights the flamens at their service quaint and the chill marble seems to sweat while each peculiar power forgoes his wonted seat peor and baalim forsake their temples dim with that twice battered god of palestine and mooned ashtaroth heaven's queen and mother both now sits not girt with tapers holy shine the libic hammon shrinks his horn in vain the tyrian maids their wounded thamuz mourn and sullen moloch fled hath left in shadows dread his burning idol all of blackest hue in vain with symbols ring they call the grisly king in dismal dance about the furnace blue and brutish gods of nile as fast isis and horus and the dog anubis haste nor is osiris seen in memphian grove or green trampling the unshowered grass with lowings loud nor can he be at rest within his sacred chest not but profoundest hell can be his shroud in vain with timbreled anthems dark the sable stolid sorcerers bear his worshipped ark he feels from judah's land the dreaded infant's hand the rays of bethlehem blind his dusky eye nor all the gods beside longer dare abide not typhon huge ending in snaky twine our babe to show his godhead true can in his swaddling bands control the damned crew so when the sun in bed curtained with cloudy red pillows his chin upon an orient wave the flocking shadows pale troop to the infernal jail each fettered ghost slips to his several grave and the yellow-skirted fays fly after the night steeds leaving their moon-loved maids. But see, the virgin blessed hath laid her babe to rest. Time is our tedious song should here have ending. Heaven's youngest teamed star hath fixed her polished car, her sleeping lord with handmaid lamp attending. And all about the courtly stable, bright-harnessed angels sit in order serviceable. End of On the Morning of Christ's Nativity The Passion by John Milton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland Erewhile of music and ethereal mirth Wherewith the stage of air and earth did ring And joyous news of heavenly infant's birth My muse with angels to divide to sing. But headlong joy is ever on the wing. In wintry solstice, like the shortened light, soon swallowed up in dark and long outliving night. For now to sorrow must I tune my song, and set my harp to notes of saddest woe, which on our dearest Lord did seize ere long, dangers and snares and wrongs, and worse than so, which he for us did freely undergo, most perfect hero, tried in heaviest plight, of labours huge and hard, too hard for human white. He, sovereign priest, stooping his regal head that dropped with odorous oil down his fair eyes, poor fleshly tabernacle entered, his starry front low-roofed beneath the sky. Oh, what a mask was there, what a disguise! Yet more, the stroke of death he must abide. Then lies him meekly down, fast by his brethren's side. These latter scenes confine my roving verse. 
to this horizon is my Phoebus bound. His godlike acts and his temptations fierce and former sufferings otherwhere are found. Loud o'er the rest Cremona's trump doth sound. Me, softer airs befit and softer strings of lute or viol still, more apt for mournful things. Befriend me, knight, best patroness of grief, over the pole thy thickest mantle throw, and work my flattered fancy to belief that heaven and earth are coloured with my woe. My sorrows are too dark for day to know. The leaves should all be black where on I write, and letters where my tears have washed a wannish white. See, See the chariot and those rushing wheels that whirled the prophet up at Kibar flood. My spirit some transporting cherub feels to bear me where the towers of Salem stood, once glorious towers now sunk in guiltless blood. There doth my soul in holy vision sit in pensive trance and anguish and ecstatic fit. Mine eye hath found that sad sepulchral rock that was the casket of heaven's richest store. And here, though grief my feeble hands uplock, yet on the softened quarry would I score my plaining verse as lively as before. For sure, so well instructed are my tears, they would fitly fall in ordered characters. I, thence hurried on viewless wing, take up a weeping on the mountains wild, the gentle neighbourhood of grove and spring, would soon unbosom all their echoes mild, and I, for grief, is easily beguiled, might think the infection of my sorrows bound had got a race of mourners on some pregnant cloud. Note, this subject, the author finding to be above the years he had, when he wrote it, and nothing satisfied with what was begun, left it unfinished. End of the Passion On Time by John Milton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland Fly, envious time, till thou run out thy race. Call on the lazy, leaden-stepping hours whose speed is but the heavy plummet's pace and glut thyself with what thy womb devours, which is no more than what is false and vain, and merely mortal dross. So little is our loss, so little is thy gain. For when as each thing bad thou hast entombed, and last of all thy greedy self consumed, then long eternity shall greet our bliss with an individual kiss, and joy shall overtake us as a flood, when everything that is sincerely good and perfectly divine, with truth and peace and love, shall ever shine about the supreme throne of him, to whose happy-making sight alone, when once our heavenly-guided soul shall climb, then all this earthly grossness quit, attired with stars, we shall for ever sit triumphing over death and chance, and thee, O oh time. Note. See the appendix for the manuscript version. End of On Time. Upon the Circumcision by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Ye flaming powers and winged warriors bright, that erst with music and triumphant song first heard by happy watchful shepherds ear, so sweetly sung your joy the clouds along through the soft silence of the listening night. Now mourn, and if sad share with us to bear your fiery essence can distill no tear, burn in your sighs and borrow seas wept from our deep sorrow. He, who with all heaven's heraldry while e'er entered the world, now bleeds to give us ease. Alas, how soon our sin soar doth begin his infancy to seize. O oh, more exceeding love or law, more just, just law indeed, 
but more exceeding love. For we, by rightful doom, remediless were lost in death, till he that dwelt above, high throned in secret bliss, for us, frail dust, emptied his glory even to nakedness. And that great covenant which we still transgress, entirely satisfied and the full wrath beside of vengeful justice bore for our excess, and seals obedience first with wounding smart this day. But, oh, ere long huge pangs and strong will pierce more near his heart. End of Upon the Circumcision At a Solemn Music by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Blessed pair of sirens, pledges of heaven's joy, sphere-born harmonious sisters, voice and verse, wed your divine sounds and mixed power employ dead things with inbreathed sense able to pierce, and to our high-raised fantasy present that undisturbed song of pure content, I sung before the sapphire-colored throne to him that sits thereon, with saintly shout and solemn jubilee, where the bright seraphim in burning row their loud uplifted angel trumpets blow. And the cherubic host in thousand choirs touch their immortal harps of golden wires with those just spirits that wear victorious palms hymns devout and holy psalms singing everlastingly, that we on earth with undiscording voice may rightly answer that melodious noise, as once we did, till disproportioned sin jarred against nature's chime, and with harsh din the fair music that all creatures made to the great Lord, whose love their motions swayed in perfect diapason, whilst they stood in first obedience and their state of good. Oh, may we soon again renew that song and keep in tune with heaven, till God ere long to his celestial consort us unite, to live with him and sing an endless morn of light. Note. Six. Content. Manuscript reads consent, as does the second edition, so that content is probably a misprint. End of At a Solemn Music An Epitaph Upon the Marchioness of Winchester by John Milton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland This rich marble doth inter the honoured wife of Winchester, a viscount's daughter, an earl's heir, besides what her virtues fair added to her noble birth, more than she could own from earth. Summers three times eight save one she had told, alas, too soon, after so short time of breath to house with darkness and with death. Yet had the number of her days been as complete as was her praise, nature and fate had had no strife in giving limit to her life. Her high birth and her graces sweet quickly found a lover meet. The virgin choir for her request the god that sits at marriage feast. He, at their invoking, came, but with a scarce well-lighted flame, and in his garland as he stood ye might discern a cypress bud. Once had the early matrons run to greet her of a lovely son, and now with second hope she goes, and calls Lucina to her throes. But whether by mischance or blame, Atropos for Lucina came, and with remorseless cruelty spoiled at once both fruit and tree. The hapless babe before his birth had burial, yet not laid in earth, and the languished mother's womb was not long a living tomb. So have I seen some tender slip saved with care from winter's nip, the pride of her carnation train, 
plucked up by some unheedy swain who only thought to crop the flower new shot up from vernal shower but the fair blossom hangs the head sideways as on a dying bed and those pearls of dew she wears prove to be presaging tears which the sad morn had let fall on her hastening funeral gentle lady may thy grave peace and quiet ever have after this thy travel sore sweet rest sees thee evermore that to give the world increase shortened hast thy own life's lease here besides the sorrowing that thy noble house doth bring here be tears of perfect moan wept for thee in helicon and some flowers and some bays for thy hearse to strew the ways sent thee from the banks of came devoted to thy virtuous name whilst thou bright saint high sitst in glory next her much like to thee in story that fair syrian shepherdess who after years of barrenness the highly favoured joseph bore to him that served for her before and at her next birth much like thee through pangs fled to felicity far within the bosom bright of blazing majesty and light there with thee new welcome saint like fortunes may her soul acquaint with thee there clad in radiant sheen no marchioness, but now a queen. End of an epitaph on the Marchioness of Winchester. Song on May Morning by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Now the bright morning star, day's harbinger, comes dancing from the east, and leads with her the flowery May, who from her green lap throws the yellow cowslip and the pale primrose. Hail, bounteous May, that dost inspire mirth and youth and warm desire. Woods and groves are of thy dressing, hill and dale doth boast thy blessing. Thus we salute thee with our early song and welcome thee, and wish thee long. End of Song on May Morning On Shakespeare, 1630, by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. What needs my Shakespeare for his honoured bones the labour of an age in pilot stones? Or that his hallowed relics should be hid under a star-appointing pyramid? Dear son of memory, great heir of fame, what needs thou such weak witness of thy name? Thou, in our wonder and astonishment, hast built thyself a live-long monument. For whilst to the shame of slow endeavouring art thy easy numbers flow, and that each heart hath from the leaves of thy unvalued book those Delphic lines with deep impression took, then thou our fancy of itself bereaving dost make us marvel with too much conceiving. And so, sepulchred, in such pomp dost lie that kings for such a tomb would wish to die. Notes on Shakespeare, reprinted 1632 in the second folio of Shakespeare. Title, An Epitaph on the Admirable Dramatic Poet W. Shakespeare. Line 1, Needs, Need. 6, Weak, Dull. 8, Live Long, Lasting. 10, Heart, Part. 13, It, Her. End of On Shakespeare. On the university carrier, who sickened in the time of his vacancy, being forbid to go to London by reason of the plague, by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Here lies old Hobson. Death hath broke his girt. And here, alas, hath laid him in the dirt, 
or else the ways being foul, twenty to one he's here stuck in a slough and overthrown. Twas such a shifter that if truth were known, death was half glad when he had got him down, for he had any time this ten years full dodged with him betwixt Cambridge and the bull, and surely death could never have prevailed had not his weekly course of carriage failed. But lately finding him so long at home, and thinking now his journey's end was come, and that he had ta'en up his latest inn, in the kind office of a chamberlain, showed him his room where he must lodge that night, pulled off his boots, and took away the light. If any ask for him, it shall be said, Hobson has supped, and is newly gone to bed. End of On the University Carrier Another on the same. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Here lieth one who did most truly prove that he could never die while he could move. So hung his destiny never to rot while he might still jog on and keep his trot. Made of sphere metal, never to decay until his revolution was at stay. Time numbers motion, yet Without a crime against old truth, motion numbered out his time, and like an engine moved with wheel and weight, his principles being ceased, he ended straight. Rest that gives all men life gave him his death, and too much breathing put him out of breath. Nor were it contradiction to affirm too long vacation hastened on his turn. Merely to drive away the time, he sickened, fainted and died, nor would with ale be quickened. Nay, quoth he, on his swooning bed outstretched, if I may not carry, sure I'll ne'er be fetched. But vow, though the cross doctors all stood hearers, for one carrier put down to make six bearers. Ease was his chief disease, and to judge right he died for heaviness that his cart went light. His leisure told him that his time was come, and lack of load made his life burdensome. That even to his last breath, Pippi would say it, as he were pressed to death, he cried, More weight! But had his doings lasted as they were, he had been an immortal carrier. Obedient to the moon, he spent his date in course reciprocal, and had his fate linked to the mutual flowing of the seas, yet Strange to think, his wane was his increase. His letters are delivered all and gone. Only remains this superscriptio. End of another on the same. L'Allegro by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Hence, loathed melancholy, of Cerberus and blackest midnight born in Stygian cave forlorn, amongst horrid shapes and shrieks and sights unholy, find out some uncouth cell where brooding darkness spreads his jealous wings and the night raven sings. There, under ebon shades and low-browed rocks as ragged as thy locks, in dark Cimmerian desert ever dwell. But come, thou goddess fair and free, in heaven eclept Euphrosyne, and by men heart-easing mirth, whom lovely Venus, at a birth with two sister graces more, to ivy-crowned Bacchus bore, or whether, as some sage sing, the frolic wind that breathes the spring Zephyr, with Aurora playing, as he met her once a-maying, There on beds of violets blue, and fresh-blown roses washed in dew, Filled her with thee, a daughter fair, so buxom, blithe, and debonair. Haste thee, nymph, and bring with thee jest and youthful jollity, Whips and cranks and wanton wiles, nods and becks and wreathed smiles such as hang on Hebe's cheek, and love to live in dimpled sleek. Sport that wrinkled care derides, and laughter holding both his sides. Come, and trip it as ye go on the light fantastic toe, 
and in thy right hand lead with thee the mountain nymph sweet liberty and if i give thee honour due mirth admit me of thy crew to live with her and live with thee in unreproved pleasures free to hear the lark begin his flight and singing startle the dull night from his watch-tower in the skies till the dappled dawn doth rise then to come in spite of sorrow and at my window bid good morrow through the sweet briar or the vine or the twisted eglantine while the cock with lively din scatters the rear of darkness thin and to the stack or the barn door stoutly struts his dames before oft listening how the hounds and horn cheerly rouse the slumbering morn from the side of some hoar hill through the high wood echoing shrill sometime walking not unseen by hedgerow elms on hillocks green right against the eastern gate where the great sun begins his state robed in flames and amber light the clouds in thousand liveries dight while the ploughman near at hand whistles o'er the furrowed land and the milkmaid singeth blithe and the mower whets his scythe and every shepherd tells his tale under the hawthorn in the dale straight mine eye hath got new pleasures whilst the landscape round it measures russet lawns and fallows grey where the nibbling flocks do stray mountains on whose barren breast the labouring clouds do often rest Meadows trim with daisies pied, shallow brooks and rivers wide, towers and battlements it sees, bosomed high in tufted trees, where perhaps some beauty lies, the cynosure of neighbouring eyes. Hard by, a cottage chimney smokes from betwixt two aged oaks, where Corridon and Thyrsus met are at their savoury dinner set of herbs and other country messes which the neat-handed phyllis dresses and then in haste her hour she leaves with festivus to bind the sheaves or if the earlier season lead to the tanned haycock in the mead sometimes with secure delight the upland hamlets will invite when the merry bells ring round and the jocund rebeck sound to many a youth and many a maid dancing in the chequered shade and young and old come forth to play on a sunshine holiday till the live-long daylight fail then to the spicy nut-brown ale with stories told of many a feat how fairy mab the junkets ate she was pinched and pulled she said and he by friar's lanthorn led tells how the drudging goblin sweat to earn his cream bowl duly set when in one night a glimpse of morn his shadowy flail hath threshed the corn that ten day labourers could not end then lies him down the lover fend and stretched out all the chimney's length basks at the fire his hairy strength and crop full out of doors he flings ere the first cock his matin rings thus done the tales to bed they creep by whispering wind soon lulled asleep towered cities please us then and the busy hum of men where throngs of knights and barons bold in weeds of peace high triumph sold with store of ladies whose bright eyes rain influence and judge the prize of wit or arms while both contend to win her grace whom all commend there let hymen oft appear in saffron robe with taper clear and pomp and feast and revelry with mask and antique pageantry such sights as youthful poets dream on summer eves by haunted stream then to the well-trod stage anon if johnson's learned sock be on or sweetest shakespeare fancy's child warble his native wood notes wild and ever against eating cares lap me in soft lydian airs married to immortal verse such as the meeting soul may pierce in notes with many a winding bout of linked sweetness long drawn out with wanton heed and giddy cunning the melting voice through mazes running 
untwisting all the chains that tie the hidden soul of harmony. That Orpheus' self may heave his head from golden slumber on a bed of heaped Elysian flowers, and hear such strains as would have won the ear of Pluto to have quite set free his half-regained Eurydice. These delights of thou canst give, mirth with thee I mean to live. Notes 933, ye, you, in 1673. Line 104, and he by, and by the, 1673. End of L'Allegro. Il Pensoroso by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Hence vain deluding joys, the brood of folly without father bred. How little you bestead or fill the mind with all your toys. Dwell in some idle brain, and fancies fond with gaudy shapes possess, as thick and numberless as the gay motes that people the sunbeams, or likest hovering dreams, the fickle pensioners of Morpheus' train. But hail thou, goddess, sage and holy, hail divinest melancholy whose saintly visage is too bright to hit the sense of human sight, and therefore to our weaker view o'erlaid with black, stayed wisdom's hue. Black, but such as in esteem Prince Memnon's sister might be seen, or that starred Ethiop queen that strove to set her beauty's praise above the sea-nymphs, and their powers offended. Yet thou art higher far descended, the bright-haired Vesta long of yore to solitary Saturn bore. His daughter, she, in Saturn's reign such mixture was not held to stain. Oft in glimmering bowers and glades he met her, and in secret shades of woody Ida's inmost grove, while yet there was no fear of Jove. Come, pensive nun, devout and pure, sober, steadfast and demure, all in a robe of darkest grain, flowing with majestic train, and sable stole of cypress lawn over thy decent shoulders drawn. Come, but keep thy wonted state with even step and musing gait, and looks commercing with the skies, thy rapt soul sitting in thine eyes. There, Held in holy passion still, forget thyself to marvel, Till, with a sad leaden downward cast, Thou fix them on the earth as fast. And join with thee calm peace and quiet, Spare fast, that oft with gods doth diet, And hears the muses in a ring, I round about Jove's altar sing. And add to these, Retired leisure that in trim gardens takes his pleasure. But first and chiefest, with thee bring him that yon soars on golden wing, guiding the fiery wheeled throne, the cherub contemplatio. And the mute silence hissed along, lest Philomel will deign a song in her sweetest, saddest plight, smoothing the rugged brow of night while Cynthia checks her dragon yoke gently o'er the customed oak. Sweet bird, that shuns the noise of folly, most musical, most melancholy. Thee, chantress, oft the woods among I woo to hear thy even song, and missing thee I walk unseen on the dry, smooth-shaven green. To behold the wandering moon riding near her highest noon, like one that had been led astray through the heaven's wide pathless way. And oft, as if her head she bowed, stooping through a fleecy cloud. Oft on a plat of rising ground I hear the far-off curfew sound over some wide-watered shore, 
swinging slow with sullen roar or if the air will not permit some still removed place will fit where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom far from all resort of mirth save the cricket on the hearth or the bellman's drowsy charm to bless the doors for nightly harm or let my lamp at midnight hour be seen in some high lonely tower where i may oft outwatch the bear with thrice great hermes or unsphere the spirit of plato to unfold what worlds or what vast regions hold the immortal mind that hath forsook her mansion in this fleshly nook and of those demons that are found in fire air flood or underground whose power hath a true consent with planet or with element sometime let gorgeous tragedy and sceptred paul come sweeping by presenting thebes or pelops line or the tale of troy divine or what though rare of later age ennobled hath the buskin stage but o oh, sad virgin that thy power might raise museus from his bower or bid the soul of orpheus sing such notes as warbled to the string drew iron tears down pluto's cheek and made hell grant what love did seek or call up him that left half told the story of cambusk and bold of campbell and of algarsaif and who had canacy to wife that owned the virtuous ring and glass and of the wondrous horse of brass on which the tartar king did ride and if aught else great bards beside in sage and solemn tunes have sung of tourneys and of trophies hung of forests and enchantments drear where more is meant than meets the ear thus night oft see me in thy pale career till civil suited morn appear not tricked and fronts till she was wont with the attic boy to hunt but kerchiefed in a comely cloud while rocking winds are piping loud or ushered with a shower still when the gust hath blown his fill ending on the rustling leaves with minute drops from off the eaves and when the sun begins to fling his flaring beams me goddess bring to archered walks of twilight grove and shadows brown that sylvan loves of pine or monumental oak where the rude axe with heaved stroke was never heard the nymphs to daunt or fright them from their hallowed haunt there in close covert by some brook where no profaner eye may look hide me from day's garish eye while the bee with honeyed thigh that at her flowery work doth sing and the waters murmuring with such consort as they keep, entice the dewy feathered sleep. And let some strange, mysterious dream wave at his wings in airy stream, of lively portraitures displayed, softly on my eyelids laid. And as I wake, sweet music breathe above, about, or underneath, sent by some spirit to mortal's good, or the unseen genius of the wood. But let my due feet never fail to walk the studious cloisters pale, and love the high embowed roof with antic pillars, massy proof, and storied windows richly dight, casting a dim religious light. There let the pealing organ blow to the full-voiced choir below, in service high and anthems clear as may with sweetness through mine ear dissolve me into ecstasies and bring all heaven before mine eyes and may at last my weary age find out the peaceful hermitage the hairy gown and mossy cell where i may sit and rightly spell of every star that heaven doth shew and every herb that sips the dew till old experience do attain to something like prophetic strain these pleasures melancholy give 
and I with thee will choose to live. End of Il Penseroso The English Sonnets from the 1545 edition by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. 1. O nightingale that on yon bloomy spray warbles at eve, when all the woods are still, thou with fresh hope the lover's heart dost fill, while the jolly hours lead on propitious May, thy liquid notes that close the eye of day first heard before the shallow cuckoo's bill portend success in love. Oh, if Jove's will have linked that amorous power to thy soft lay, now timely sing, ere the rude bird of hate foretell my hopeless doom in some grove nigh. As thou from year to year hast sung too late for my relief, yet hadst no reason why. Whether the muse or love call thee his mate, both them I serve, and of their train am I. 7. How soon hath time, the subtle thief of youth, stolen on his wing my three-and-twentieth year? My hasting days fly on with full career, but my late spring no bud or blossom shoot. Perhaps my semblance might deceive the truth that I to manhood am arrived so near, and inward ripeness doth much less appear that some more timely happy spirits endure. Yet be it less or more, or soon or slow, it shall be still in strictest measure even, to that same lot, however mean or high, toward which time leads me, and the will of heaven. All is if I have grace to use it so, as ever in my great taskmaster's eye. 8. Captain, or colonel, or knight in arms, whose chance on these defenceless doors may seize, if ever deed of honour did thee please, guard them, and him within protect from harms. He can requite thee, for he knows the charms that call fame on such gentle acts as these, and he can spread thy name o'er lands and seas, whatever climb the sun's bright circle warm. Lift not thy spear against the muse's bower. The great Emathian conqueror bid spare the house of Pindarus when temple and tower went to the ground, and the repeated air of sad Electra's poet had the power to save the Athenian walls from ruin bare. Notes Cambridge Autograph supplies title when the assault was intended to the city. Line 3 if deed of honour did thee ever please, in 1633. 9. Lady, that in the prime of earliest youth wisely hath shunned the broad way and the green, and with those few art eminently seen that labour up the hill of heavenly truth, the better part with Mary and with Ruth chosen thou hast, and they that overween, and that thy growing virtues fret their spleen, no anger find in thee, but pity and ruth. Thy care is fixed, and zealously attends to fill thy odorous lamp with deeds of light, and hope that reaps not shame. Therefore be sure, thou, when the bridegroom with his feastful friends passes to bliss at the mid-hour of night, hast gained thy entrance. Virgin wise and pure. Note 5. With Ruth, the Ruth. 1645. 10. Daughter to that good earl, once president of England's council, and her treasury, who lived in both, unstained with gold or fee, and left them both, more in himself content, till the sad breaking of that parliament broke him, as that dishonest victory at Caronea, fatal to liberty, killed with report that old man eloquent. Though later born than to have known the days wherein your father flourished, yet by you, madam, he thinks I see him living yet. So well your words his noble virtues praise, that all both judge you to relate them true, and to possess them. Homage. 
Margaret. Note, Cambridge Autograph Supplies Title to the Lady Margaret Lee. End of the English Sonnets from the 1545 edition. Arcades by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Arcades, part of an entertainment presented to the Countess Dowager of Derby at Harefield by some noble persons of her family, who appear on the scene in pastoral habit, moving toward the seat of state with this song. One, song. Look, nymphs and shepherds, look. What sudden blaze of majesty is that which we from hence descry? Too divine to be mistook. This, this is she to whom our vows and wishes bend. Here our solemn search hath end. Fame that her high worth to raise seemed erst so lavish and profuse, we may justly now accuse of detraction from her praise. Less than half we find expressed. Envy did conceal the rest. Mark what radiant state she spreads in circle round her shining throne, shooting her beams like silver threads. This, this is she alone sitting like a goddess bright in the centre of her light. Might she the wise Latona be, or the towered Sibylle, mother of a hundred gods? Juno dares not give her odds. Who had thought? This climate held a deity so unparalleled. As they come forward, the genius of the wood appears, and turning toward them speaks. Genius. Stay, gentle swains, for though in this disguise I see bright honor sparkle through your eyes, of famous Arcady ye are, and sprung of that renowned flood so often sung, divine Alpheus who by secret slews stole under seas to meet his arathues. And ye, the breathing roses of the wood, fair silver buskined nymphs as great and good, I know this quest of yours and free intent was all in honour and devotion meant to the great mistress of yon princely shrine, whom with low reverence I adore as mine, and with all helpful service will comply to further this night's glad solemnity, and lead ye where ye may more near behold what shallow searching fame hath left untold, which I full oft amidst these shades alone have sate to wonder at and gaze upon. For know by lot from Jove I am the power of this fair wood, and live in oaken bower to nurse the saplings tall and curl the grove with ringlets quaint and wanton windings woe. And all my plants I save from nightly ill of noisome winds and blasting vapours chill, and from the boughs brush off the evil dew, and heal the harms of thwarting thunder blue, or what the cross dialoguing planet smites, or hurtful worm with cankered venom bites. When evening grey doth rise, I fetch my round over the mount and all this hallowed ground, and early, ere the odorous breath of morn awakes the slumbering leaves, or tasselled horn shakes the high thicket, haste I all about, number my ranks, and visit every sprout with puissant words, and murmurs made to bless. But else, in deep of night, when drowsiness hath locked up mortal sense, then listen I to the celestial siren's harmony, that sit upon the nine enfolded spheres, and sing to those that hold the vital shears, and turn the adamantine spindle round, on which the fate of gods and men is wound. Such sweet compulsion doth in music lie, to lull the daughters of necessity, and keep unsteady nature to her law, and the low world in measured motion draw after the heavenly tune, which none can hear of human mould with gross unperjured ear. And yet, such music worthiest were to blaze the peerless height of her immortal praise, whose lustre leads us, and for her most fit, if my inferior hand or voice could hit inimitable sounds, yet, as we go, 
what e'er the skill of lesser gods can show i will assay her worth to celebrate and so attend ye toward her glittering state where ye may all that are of noble stem approach and kiss her sacred vesture's hem two song o'er the smooth enamelled green where no print of step hath been follow me as i sing and touch the warbled string under the shady roof of branching elm star proof follow me i will bring you where she sits clad in splendour as befits a deity such a rural queen all arcadia hath not seen three song nymphs and shepherds dance no more by sandy ladon's lily banks on old lycaeus or salini hoar trip no more in twilight ranks though erinath your loss deplore a better soil shall give ye thanks from the stony menelus bring your flocks and live with us here ye shall have greater grace to serve the lady of this place though syrinx your pan's mistress were yet syrinx well might wait on her such a rural queen all arcadia hath not seen note twenty two hundred milton's own spelling here is hundred but in the errata to paradise lost book one line seven sixty he corrects hundred to hundred end of arcades this recording is in the public domain. Lycidas by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Transcriber's note. Facsimile of title page of Lycidas follows. Justa, Eduardo King, Naufrago, Ab Amicis, Norentibus, Amoris, et manias caen serecta calculam ponas ubique naufragium est pet arm cantabrigia apud tomam book et rogerum danio cadaberimae academiae topographos sixteen thirty eight lycidas in this monody the author bewails a learned friend unfortunately drowned in his passage from chester on the irish seas 1637 and by occasion foretells the ruin of our corrupted clergy then in their height yet once more o ye laurels and once more ye myrtles brown with ivy never sear i come to pluck your berries harsh and crude and with forced fingers rude shatter your leaves before the mellowing year bitter constraint and sad occasion dear compels me to disturb your season you for lycidas is dead dead ere his prime young lycidas and hath not left his peer who would not sing for lycidas he knew himself to sing and build the lofty rhyme he must not float upon his watery bier unwept and welter to the parching wind without the meed of some melodious tear begin then sisters of the sacred well that from beneath the seat of jove doth spring begin and somewhat loudly sweep the stream hence with denial vain and coy excuse so may some gentle muse with lucky words favour my destined urn and as he passes turn and bid fair peace be to my sable shroud for we were nursed upon the self-same hill fed the same flock by fountain shade and rill together both ere the high lawns appeared under the opening eyelids of the morn we drove afield and both together heard what time the grey fly winds her sultry horn fattening our flocks with the fresh dews of night oft till the star that rose at evening bright toward heaven's descent had sloped his westering wheel meanwhile the rural ditties were not mute tempered with oaten flute rough satyrs danced and fawns with cloven heel from the glad sound would not be absent long 
and old Demetus loved to hear our song. But, oh, the heavy change, now thou art gone. Now thou art gone, and never must return. Thee, shepherd, thee the woods and desert caves, with wild thyme and the gadding vine or grove, and all their echoes mourn. The willows and the hazel copses green shall now no more be seen fanning their joyous leaves to thy soft lane as killing as the canker to the rose, or taint-worm to the weanling herds that graze, or frost to flowers that their gay water wear, when first the white thorn blows. Such, Lycidas, thy loss to shepherd's ear. Where were ye, nymphs, when the remorseless deep closed o'er the head of your loved Lycidas? For neither were you playing on the steep where your old bards, the famous druids, lie, nor on the shaggy top of Mona High, nor yet where Diva spreads her wizard stream. Ay, me, I fondly dream had ye been there. For what could that have done? What could the muse herself that Orpheus bore, the muse herself for her enchanting son, whom universal nature did lament, when by the rout that made the hideous roar his gory visage down the stream was sent? down the swift Hebrus to the lesbian shore. Alas, what boots it with uncessant care to tend the homely, slighted shepherd's trade and strictly meditate the thankless muse? Were it not better done, as others use, to sport with Amaryllis in the shade or with the tangles of Neira's hair? Fame is the spur that the clear spirit doth raise that last infirmity of noble mind to scorn delights and live laborious days. But the fair guerdon when we hope to find and think to burst out into sudden blaze comes the blind fury with the horrid shears and slits the thin-spun life. But not the praise, Phoebus replied, and touched my trembling ears. Fame is no plant that grows on mortal soil, nor in the glistering foil set off to whirl, nor in broad rumour lies, but lives and spreads aloft by those pure eyes and perfect witness of all judging Jove, as he pronounces lastly on each deed, of so much fame in heaven expect thy need. O fountain Arethuse, and thou honoured flood smooth sliding Mincius, crowned with vocal reeds, that strain I heard was of a higher mood. But now my oat proceeds and listens to the herald of the sea that came in Neptune's plea. He asked the waves and asked the felon winds what hard mishap hath doomed this gentle swain and questioned every gust of rugged wings that blows from off each beaked promontory. They knew not of his story, and sage Hippotides their answer brings that not a blast was from his dungeon strayed. The air was calm, and on the level brine sleep panopy with all her sisters played. It was that fatal and perfidious bark built in the cliffs and rigged with curses dark that sunk so low that sacred head of thine. Next Camus, reverend sire, went footing slow, his mantle hairy and his bonnet sedge, inwrought with figures dim, and on the edge like to that sanguine flower inscribed with woe. Ah, who hath reft, quoth he, my dearest pledge? Last came, and last did go the pilot of the Galilean lake. Two massy keys he bore of metals twain, the golden opes, the iron shuts amain. He shook his mitred locks and stern bespake, How well could I have spared for thee, young swain, and now of such as for their belly's sake creep and intrude and climb into the fold. Of other care they little reckoning make than how to scramble at the shearer's feast and shove away the worthy bidden guest. 
blind mouths that scarce themselves know how to hold a sheeple for i've learned aught else the least that to the faithful herdman's art belongs what wrecks it them what need they they are sped and when they list their lean and flashy songs grate on their scrannel pipes of wretched straw the hungry sheep look up and are not fed but swoln with wind and the rank mist they draw rot inwardly and foul contagion spread besides but the grim wolf with privy paw daily devours apace and nothing said but that two-handed engine at the door stands ready to smite once and smite no more return alpheus the dread voice is past to shrunk thy streams return sicilian muse and call the veils and bid them hither cast their bells and flowerets of a thousand hues ye valleys low where the mild whispers use of shades and wanton winds and gushing brooks on whose fresh lap the swart star sparely looks throw hither all your quaint enamelled eyes that on the green turf suck the honeyed showers and purple all the ground with vernal flowers bring the wrath primrose that forsaken dies the tufted croto and pale jessamine the white pink and the pansy freaked with jet the glowing violet the musk rose and the well-attired woodbine with cowslips wan that hang the pensive head and every flower that sad embroidery wears bid amaranthus all his beauty shed daffodillies fill their cups with tears and strew the laureate hearse where lysid lies for so to interpose a little ease let our frail thoughts dally with false surmise ah me whilst thee the shores and sounding seas wash far away where e'er thy bones are heard whether beyond the stormy hebrides where thou perhaps under the whelming tide visits the bottom of the monstrous world or whether thou to our moist vows denied sleep'st by the fable of Belarus old where the great vision of the guarded mount looks toward Mamancos and Bionas hold look homeward angel now and melt with ruth and o ye dolphins waft the hapless youth weep no more woeful shepherds weep no more for lycidas your sorrow is not dead sunk though he be beneath the watery floor so sinks the day star in the ocean bed and yet anon repairs his drooping head and tricks his beams and with new spangled ore flames in the forehead of the morning sky so lycidas sunk low but mounted high through the dear might of him that walked the waves where other groves and other streams along with nectar pure his oozy locks he laves and hears the unexpressive nuptial song in the blessed kingdoms meek of joy and love there entertain him all the saints above in solemn troops and sweet societies that sing and singing in their glory move and wipe the tears for ever from his eyes now lycidas the shepherds weep no more henceforth thou art the genius of the shore in thy large recompense and shalt be good to all that wander in that perilous flood Thus sang the uncouth swain to the oaks and rills, while the still morn went out with sandals grey. He touched the tender stops of various quills, with eager thought warbling his Doric lay. And now the sun had stretched out all the hills, and now was dropped into the western bay. At last he rose, and twitched his mantle blue, Tomorrow to fresh woods and pastures new. Notes 64. Uncessant. Manuscript reads incessant, so that uncessant is probably a misprint. 
though that spelling is retained in the second edition. 82. Perfect. So, in Comus, line 203, in both these places the manuscript has perfect, as elsewhere where the word occurs. In The Solemn Music, line 23, where the first edition reads perfect, the second reads perfect. 149. Amaranthus. Amaranthus. End of Lycidas. Introductory Material to Comus, A Mask, by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. A Mask Presented at Ludlow Castle, 1634, on Michaelmas Night, before the Right Honourable John Earl of Bridgewater, by Count Brackley, Lord President of Wales, and one of His Majesty's Most Honourable Privy Council. Ehu quid volui misero mihi. Floribus Austrum Perditus. London, printed for Humphrey Robinson at the sign of the Three Pigeons in Paul's Churchyard, 1637. To the Right Honourable John Lord Viscount Brackley, son and heir apparent to the Earl of Bridgewater, etc. My Lord, this poem, which received its first occasion of birth from yourself and others of your noble family, and much honour from your own person in the performance, now returns again to make a final dedication of itself to you. Although not openly acknowledged by the author, yet it is a legitimate offspring, so lovely and so much desired, that the often copying of it hath tired my pen to give my several friends satisfaction, and brought me to a necessity of producing it to the public view. And now, to offer it up in all rightful devotion, to those fair hopes and rare endowments of your much promising youth, which give a full assurance to all that know you of a future excellence. Live, sweet Lord, to be the honour of your name, and receive this as your own from the hands of him who hath by many favours been long obliged to your most honoured parents, and, as in this representation, your attendant thyrsus, so now in all real expression, your faithful and most humble servant, H. Laws. Note, dedication to Viscount Brackley, omitted in 1673. The copy of a letter written by Sir Henry Wotton to the author upon the following poem. From the College, this 13th of April, 1638. Sir, it was a special favour when you lately bestowed upon me here the first taste of your acquaintance, though no longer than to make me know that I wanted more time to value it, and to enjoy it rightly. And, in truth, if I could then have imagined your farther stay in these parts, which I understood afterwards by Mr. H., I would have been bold in our vulgar phrase to mend my draught, for you left me with an extreme thirst, and to have begged your conversation again, jointly with your said learned friend, at a poor meal or two, that we might have banded together some good authors of the ancient time among which I observed you to have been familiar. Since your going, you have charged me with new obligations, both for a very kind letter from you, dated the 6th of this month, and for a dainty piece of entertainment which came therewith, wherein I should much commend the tragical part, if the lyrical did not ravish me with a certain Doric delicacy in your songs and odes, whereunto I must plainly confess to have seen yet nothing parallel in our language, ipsum ulities. But I must not omit to tell you that I now only owe you thanks for intimating unto me, how modestly soever, the true artificer. For the work itself I had viewed some good while before, with singular delight, having received it from our common friend, Mr. R., in the very close of the late R.'s poems, printed at Oxford, whereunto it was added, as I now suppose, that the accessory might help out the principle, according to the art of stationers, and to leave the reader con la bocca dolce. Now, sir, concerning your travels, wherein I may challenge a little more privilege of discourse with you, I suppose you will not blanch Paris in the way. Therefore, I have been bold to trouble you with a few lines to Mr. M. B., 
whom you shall easily find attending the young Lord S. as his governor, and you may surely receive from him good directions for the shaping of your farther journey into Italy, where he did reside by my choice some time for the king, after mine own recess from Venice. I should think that your best line will be through the whole length of France to Marseille, and thence by sea to Genoa, whence the passage into Tuscany is as diurnal as a Gravesend bar. I hasten, as you do, to Florence, or Siena, the rather to tell you a short story from the interest you have given me in your safety. At Siena I was tabled in the house of one Alberto Scipioni, an old Roman courtier in dangerous times, having been steward to the Duca di Pagliano, who, with all his family, were strangled save this only man that escaped by foresight of the tempest. With him I had often much chat of those affairs, into which he took pleasure to look back from his native harbour. And at my departure toward Rome, which had been the centre of his experience, I had won confidence enough to beg his advice, how I might carry myself securely there, without offence of my own conscience. Signor Arrigo mio, says he, i pensieri stretti ed il viso sciolto. I uh, will go safely over the whole world, of which Delphian oracle, for so I have found it, your judgment doth need no commentary. And therefore, sir, I will commit you with it to the best of all securities, God's dear love, remaining your friend as much at command as any of longer date, Henry Wooten. Postscript. Sir, I have expressly sent this my footboy, to prevent your departure without some acknowledgment from me of the receipt of your obliging letter, having myself, through some business I know not how, neglected the ordinary conveyance. In any part where I shall understand you fixed, I shall be glad and diligent to entertain you with home novelties, even for some fomentation of our friendship, too soon interrupted in the cradle. Note. Letter from Sir Henry Wooden, omitted in 1673. End of introductory material to Comus. Comus, a Mass, by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. A Mass presented at Ludlow Castle, 1634, etc. The Persons. The attendant spirit, afterwards in the habit of Thyrsus, Comus with his crew, the lady, first brother, second brother, Sabrina the nymph. The chief persons which presented were the Lord Brackley, Mr. Thomas Edgerton's brother, the lady Alice Edgerton. The first scene discovers a wild wood. The attendant spirit descends or enters. Spirit. Before the starry threshold of Jove's court my mansion is, where those immortal shapes of bright aerial spirits live in sphered, in regions mild of calm and serene air. Above the smoke and stir of this dim spot, which men call earth, and with low-thoughted care confined, and pestered in this pinfold here, strive to keep up a frail and feverish being, unmindful of the crown that virtue gives after this mortal change to her true servants amongst the enthroned gods on sainted seats. Yet some there be that by due steps aspire to lay their just hands on that golden key that opes the palace of eternity. To such my errand is, and but for such I would not soil these pure ambrosial weeds with the rank vapours of this sin-worn mould but to my task. Neptune, besides the sway of every salt flood and each ebbing stream, took in by lot twixt high and nether Jove imperial rule of all the sea-girt isles, that like to rich and various gems inlay the unadorned bosom of the deep, which he to grace his tributary gods by course commits to several government, and gives them leave to wear their sapphire crowns and wield their little tridents, but this isle, the greatest and the best of all the main, he quarters to his blue-haired deities, and all this tract that fronts the falling sun, the noble peer of mickle trust and power, has in his charge. 
with tempered awe to guide an old and haughty nation proud in arms where his fair offspring nursed in princely lore are coming to attend their father's state and new entrusted sceptre but their way lies through the perplexed paths of this drear wood the nodding horror of whose shady brows threats the forlorn and wandering passenger and here their tender age might suffer peril but that by quick command from sovereign jove i was dispatched for their defence and guard and listen why for i will tell ye now what never yet was heard in tale or song from old or modern bard in hall or bower Bacchus, that first from out the purple grape crushed the sweet poison of misused wine after the tuscan mariners transformed coasting the tyrrhene shore as the winds listed on circe's island fell who knows not circe the daughter of the sun whose charmed cup whoever tasted lost his upright shape and downward fell into a groveling swine this nymph that gazed upon his clustering locks with ivy berries wreathed and his blithe youth had by him ere he parted thence a son much like his father but his mother more whom therefore she brought up and comus named who ripe and frolic of his full-grown age roving the celtic and iberian fields at last betakes him to this ominous wood and in thick shelter of black shades embowered excels his mother at her mighty art offering to every weary traveller his orient liquor in a crystal glass to quench the drought of phoebus which as they taste for most do taste through fond intemperate thirst soon as the potion works their human countenance the express resemblance of the gods is changed into some brutish form of wolf or bear or ounce or tiger hog or bearded goat all other parts remaining as they were and they so perfect is their misery not once perceive their foul disfigurement but boast themselves more comely than before and all their friends and native home forget to roll with pleasure in a sensual sty therefore when any favoured of high jove chances to pass through this adventurous glade swift as the sparkle of a glancing star i shoot from heaven to give him safe convoy as now i do but first i must put off these my sky robes spun out of iris woof and take the weeds and likeness of a swain that to the service of this house belongs who with his soft pipe and smooth dittied song well knows to still the wild winds when they roar and hush the waving woods marvellous faith and in this office of his mountain watch likest and nearest to the present aid of this occasion but i hear the tread of hateful steps i must be viewless now comus enters with a charming rod in one hand his glass in the other with him a rout of monsters headed like sundry sorts of wild beasts but otherwise like men and women their apparel glistering they come in making a riotous and unruly noise with torches in their hands comus the star that bids the shepherd fold now the top of heaven doth hold and the gilded car of day his glowing axle doth allay in the steep atlantic stream and the slope sun his upward beam shoots against the dusky pole pacing toward the other goal of his chamber in the east meanwhile welcome joy and feast midnight shout and revelry tipsy dance and jollity braid your locks with rosy twine dropping odors dropping wine rigor now is gone to bed and advice with scrupulous head strict age and sour severity with their grave saws in slumber lie we that are a purer fire imitate the starry choir who in their nightly watchful spheres lead in swift round the months and years the sounds and seas with all their finny drove now to the moon in wavering morris move and on the tawny sands and shelves trip the pert fairies and the dapper elves 
by dimpled brook and fountain brim the wood nymphs decked with daisies trim their merry wakes and pastimes keep what hath night to do with sleep night hath better sweets to prove venus now wakes and wakens love come let us our rites begin tis only daylight that makes sin which these dun shades will ne'er report hail goddess of nocturnal sport dark veiled cotito to whom the secret flame of midnight torches burns mysterious dame that ne'er art called but when the dragon womb of stygian darkness spets her thickest gloom and makes one blot of all the air stay thy cloudy ebon chair wherein thou ridest with Eckert, and befriend us thy vowed priests till utmost end of all thy dues be done and none left out ere the blabbing eastern scout the nice morn on the indian steep from her cabin loophole peep and to the tell-tale sun descry our concealed solemnity come knit hands and beat the ground in a light fantastic round the measure break off break off i feel the different pace of some chaste footing near about this ground run to your shrouds within these brakes and trees our number may affright some virgin sure for so i can distinguish by my art benighted in these woods now to my charms and to my wily trains i shall ere long be well stocked with as fair a herd as grazed about my mother circe thus i hurl my dazzling spells into the spongy air of power to cheat the eye with blear illusion and give it false presentments lest the place and my quaint habits breed astonishment and put the damsel to suspicious flight which must not be for that's against my course i under fair pretence of friendly ends and well-placed words of glozing courtesy baited with reasons not unplausible wind me into the easy-hearted man and hug him into snares when once her eye hath met the virtue of this magic dust i shall appear some harmless villager whom thrift keeps up about his country gear but here she comes I fairly step aside, and hearken, if I may, her business here. The lady enters. Lady. This way the noise was, if my near be true, my best guide now. We thought it was the sound of riot and ill-managed merriment, such as the jock and flute or gamesome pipe stirs up among the loose unlettered hinds, when for their teeming flocks and granges full, in wanton dance they praise the bounteous pan and thank the gods amiss. I should be loath to meet the rudeness and swilled insolence of such late wassellers. Yet, oh, where else shall I inform my unacquainted feet in the blind mazes of this tangled wood? My brothers, when they saw me wearied out with this long way, resolving here to lodge under the spreading favour of these pines, stepped, as they said, to the next thicket side to bring me berries, or such cooling fruit as the kind hospitable woods provide they left me then when the grey hooded even like a sad votarist in palmer's weed rose from the hindmost wheels of phoebus wain but where they are and why they came not back is now the labour of my thoughts tis likeliest they had engaged their wandering steps too far and envious darkness ere they could return had stole them from me else o oh, thievish knight why shouldst thou but for some felonious end in thy dark lantern thus close up the stars that nature hung in heaven and filled their lamps with everlasting oil to give due light to the misled and lonely traveller this is the place as well as i may guess whence even now the tumult of loud mirth was rife and perfect in my listening ear yet not but single darkness do i find what might this be 
a thousand fantasies begin to throng into my memory of calling shapes and beckoning shadows dire and airy tongues that syllable men's names on sands and shores and desert wildernesses these thoughts may startle well but not astound the virtuous mind that ever walks attended by a strong siding champion conscience o oh, welcome pure-eyed faith white-handed hope thou hovering angel girt with golden wings and thou unblemished form of chastity i see ye visibly and now believe that he the supreme good to whom all things ill are but as slavish officers of vengeance would send a glistering guardian if need were to keep my life and honour unassailed was i deceived or did a sable cloud turn forth her silver lining on the night i did not err there does a sable cloud turn forth her silver lining on the night and casts a gleam over this tufted grove i cannot hallow to my brothers but such noise as i can make to be heard farthest i'll enter for my new enlivened spirits prompt me and they perhaps are not far off song sweet echo sweetest nymph that livest unseen within thy airy shell by slow meanders margent green and in the violet embroidered veil where the lovelorn nightingale nightly to thee her sad song mourneth well canst thou not tell me of a gentle pair that likest thy narcissus on oh if thou have hid them in some flowery cave tell me but where sweet queen of parley daughter of the sphere so mayst thou be translated to the skies and give resounding grace to all heaven's harmonies comus can any mortal mixture of earth's mould breathe such divine enchanting ravishment sure something holy lodges in that breast and with these raptures moves the vocal air to testify his hidden residence how sweetly did they float upon the wings of silence through the empty vaulted night at every fall smoothing the raven down of darkness till it smiled i have oft heard my mother circe with the sirens three amidst the flowery kirtled naiades culling their potent herbs and baleful drugs who as they sung would take the prisoned soul and lap it in illusion scylla wept and chid her barking waves into attention and fell charybdis murmured soft applause yet they in pleasing slumber lulled the sense and in sweet madness robbed it of itself but such a sacred and home-felt delight such sober certainty of waking bliss i never heard till now i'll speak to her and she shall be my queen hail foreign wonder whom certain these rough shades did never breed unless the goddess that in rural shrine dwellst here with pan or sylvan by blessed song forbidding every bleak unkindly fog to touch the prosperous growth of this tall wood lady nay gentle shepherd ill is lost that praise that is addressed to unattending ears not any boast of skill but extreme shift how to regain my severed company compelled me to awake the courteous echo to give me answer from her mossy couch Thomas, what chance good lady hath bereft you thus lady dim darkness and this heavy labyrinth Thomas, could that divide you from near ushering guides lady they left me weary on a grassy turf Comus, by falsehood what is courtesy or why lady to seek in valley some cool friendly spring Comus, and left your fair side all unguarded lady lady they were but twain and purposed quick return Comus, perhaps forestalling night prevented them lady how easy my misfortune is to hit comus imports their loss beside the present need lady 
no less than if I should my brothers lose. Thomas, were they of manly prime or youthful bloom? Lady, as smooth as Hebe's their unraised lips. Thomas, two such I saw what time the laboured ox in his loose traces from the furrow came, and the swinked hedger at his supper sate, I saw them under a green mantling vine that crawls along the side of yon small hill, plucking bright clusters from the tender shoots. Their port was more than human as they stood. I took it for a fairy vision of some gay creatures of the element that in the colours of the rainbow live, and play at plighted clouds. I was awestruck and as I passed, I worshipped. If those you seek, it were a journey like the path to heaven to help you find them. Lady, gentle villager, what readiest way would bring me to that place? Comus, due west it rises from this shrubby point. Lady, to find out that good shepherd, I suppose, in such a scant allowance of starlight, would overtask the best land pilot's art without the sure guess of well-practised feet. Comus, I know each lane and every alley green, dingle or bushy dell of this wild wood, and every bosky bourne from side to side, my daily walks and ancient neighbourhood. And if your stray attendants be yet lodged, or shroud within these limits, I shall know ere morrow wake, or the low-roosted lark from her thatch pallet rouse, if otherwise, I can conduct you, lady, to a low but loyal cottage, where you may be safe till further quest. Lady, shepherd, I take thy word, and trust thy honest offered courtesy, which oft is sooner found in lowly sheds with smoky rafters than in tapestry halls and courts of princes, where it first was named, and yet is most pretended. In a place less warranted than this, or less secure, I cannot be, that I should fear to change it. I may bless providence, and square my trial to my proportioned strength. Shepherd, lead on. The Two Brothers Elder Brother Unmuffle, ye faint stars, and thou, fair moon, that wants to love the traveller's benison, Stoop thy pale visage through an amber cloud, and disinherit chaos that reigns here in double night of darkness and of shades. Or, if your influence be quite dammed up with black usurping mists, some gentle taper, though a rush candle from the wicker hole of some clay habitation, visit us with thy long level rule of streaming light, and thou shalt be our star of Arcady, O Tyrian Sinoshore. Second brother, or if our eyes be barred that happiness, might we but hear the folded flocks penned in their wattled coats, or sound of pastoral reed with oaten stops, or whistle from the lodge, or village cock count the night watches to his feathery dames. Twould be some solace yet, some little cheering, in this close dungeon of innumerous boughs. But, oh, that hapless virgin, our lost sister, where may she wander now? Whether betake her from the chill dew amongst rude burrs and thistles? Perhaps some cold bank is her bolster now, against the rugged bark of some broad elm leans her unpillowed head, fraught with sad fears. What if in wild amazement and affright, or while we speak within the direful grasp of savage hunger or of savage heat, Elder brother, peace, brother, be not over-exquisite to cast the fashion of uncertain evils. For grant they be so, while they rest unknown, what need a man forestall his date of grief, and run to meet what he would most avoid? Or, if they be but false alarms of fear, how bitter is such self-delusion? I do not think my sister so to seek, or so unprincipled in virtue's book, and the sweet peace that goodness bosoms ever, as that the single want of light and noise, not being in danger, as I trust she is not, could stir the constant mood of her calm thoughts and put them into misbecoming plight. Virtue could see to do what virtue would by her own radiant light, though sun and moon were in the salt sea sunk, and wisdom self oft seeks to sweet retired solitude, 
where with her best nurse contemplation she plumes her feathers and lets grow her wings that in the various bustle of resort were all too ruffled and sometimes impaired he that has light within his own dear breast may sit in the centre and enjoy bright day but he that hides a dark soul in foul thoughts benighted walks under the midday sun himself is his own dungeon second brother tis most true that musing meditation most affects the pensive secrecy of desert cell far from the cheerful haunt of men and herds and sits as safe as in a senate house for who would rob a hermit of his weeds his few books or his beads or maple dish or do his grey hairs any violence but beauty like the fair hesperian tree laden with blooming gold had need the guard of dragon watch with unenchanted eye to save her blossoms and defend her fruit from the rash hand of bold incontinence you may as well spread out the unsunned heaps of miser's treasure by an outlaw's den and tell me it is safe as bid me hope danger will wink on opportunity and let a single helpless maiden pass uninjured in this wild surrounding waste of night or loneliness it wrecks me not i fear the dread events that dog them both lest some ill-greeting touch attempt the person of our unowned sister elder brother i do not brother infer as if i thought my sister's state secure without all doubt or controversy yet where an equal poise of hope and fear does arbitrate the vent my nature is that i incline to hope rather than fear and gladly banish squint suspicion my sister is not so defenceless left as you imagine she has a hidden strength which you remember not second brother what hidden strength unless the strength of heaven if you mean that elder brother i mean that too but yet a hidden strength which if heaven gave it may be termed her own tis chastity my brother chastity she that has that is clad in complete steel and like a quivered nymph with arrows keen may trace huge forests and unharboured heaths infamous hills and sandy perilous wilds where through the sacred rays of chastity no savage fierce bandit or mountaineer will dare to soil her virgin purity yea there where very desolation dwells by grots and caverns shagged with horrid shades she may pass on with unblenched majesty be it not done in pride or in presumption some say no evil thing that walks by night in fog or fire by lake or moorish fen blue meagre hag or stubborn unlaid ghost that breaks his magic chains at curfew time no goblin or swart fairy of the mine hath hurtful power or true virginity do ye believe me yet or shall i call antiquity from the old schools of greece to testify the arms of chastity hence had the huntress dian her dread bow fair silver-shafted queen for ever chased wherewith she tamed the brinded lioness and spotted mountain pard but set at naught the frivolous bolt of cupid gods and men feared her stern frown and she was queen of the woods what was that snaky-headed gorgon shield that wise minerva wore unconquered virgin wherewith she freezed her foes to congealed stone but rigid looks of chaste austerity and noble grace that dashed brute violence with sudden adoration and blank awe so dear to heaven is saintly chastity that when a soul is found sincerely so a thousand liveried angels lackey her driving far off each thing of sin and guilt and in clear dream and solemn vision tell her of things that no gross ear can hear till oft converse with heavenly habitants begin to cast a beam on thoutward shape the unpolluted temple of the mind and turns it by degrees to the soul's essence till all be made immortal but when lust by unchaste looks loose gestures and foul talk but most by lewd and lavish act of sin lets in defilement to the inward parts the soul grows clotted by contagion, embodies and imbrutes, till she quite lose the divine property of her first being. 
such are those thick and gloomy shadows damp oft seen in charnel vaults and sepulchres lingering and sitting by a new-made grave as loath to leave the body that it loved and linked itself by carnal sensuality to a degenerate and degraded state second brother how charming is divine philosophy not harsh and crabbed as dull fools suppose but musical as is apollo's lute and a perpetual feast of nectared sweets where no crude surfeit reigns elder brother list list i hear some far-off hollow break the silent air second brother methought so too what should it be elder brother for certain either some one like us night foundered here or else some neighbour woodman or at worst some roving robber calling to his fellows second brother heaven keep my sister again again and near best draw and stand upon our guard elder brother i'll hallow if he be friendly he comes well if not defence is a good cause and heaven be for us enter the attendant spirit habited like a shepherd that hallow i should know what are you speak come not too near you fall on iron stakes else spirit what voice is that my young lord speak again second brother oh brother tis my father shepherd sure elder brother thyrsis whose artful strains have oft delayed the huddling brook to hear his madrigal and sweetened every muskrose of the dale how camest thou here good swain hath any ram slipped from the fold or young kid lost his dam or straggling weather the pent flock forsook how couldst thou find this dark sequestered nook spirit o oh, my loved master's heir and his next joy i came not here on such a trivial toy as a strayed you or to pursue the stealth of pilfering wolf not all the fleecy wealth that doth enrich these downs is worth a thought to this my errand and the care it brought but o oh, my virgin lady where is she how chance she is not in your company elder brother to tell thee sadly shepherd without blame or our neglect we lost her as we came spirit i me unhappy then my fears are true elder brother what fears good thyrsus prithee briefly shew spirit i'll tell ye tis not vain or fabulous though so esteemed by shallow ignorance what the sage poets taught by the heavenly muse storied of old in high immortal verse of dire chimeras and enchanted isles and rifted rocks whose entrance leads to hell for such there be but unbelief is blind within the navel of this hideous wood immured in cypress shades a sorcery dwells of bacchus and of circe born great comus deep skilled in all his mother's witcheries and here to every thirsty wanderer by sly enticement gives his baneful cup with many murmurs mixed whose pleasing poison the visage quite transforms of him that drinks and the inglorious likeness of a beast fixes instead unmoulding reason's mintage charactered in the face this have i learnt tending my flocks hard by at hilly crofts that brow this bottom glade whence night by night he and his monstrous rout are heard to howl like stabled wolves or tigers at their prey doing abhorred rites to hecate in their obscured haunts and inmost bowers yet have they many baits and guileful spells to inveigle and invite the unwary sense of them that pass unweeting by the way this evening late by then the chewing flocks had tain their supper on the savoury herb of nutgrass dubus brent and were in fold i sate me down to watch upon a bank with ivy canopy and interwove with flaunting honeysuckle and began wrapped in a pleasing fit of melancholy to meditate my rural minstrelsy till fancy had her fill but ere a close the wonted roar was up amidst the woods and filled the air with barbarous dissonance at which i ceased and listened them a while till an unusual stop of sudden silence gave respite to the drowsy frighted steeds that draw the litter of close-curtained sleep 
At last a soft and solemn breathing sound rose like a steam of rich distilled perfumes, and stole upon the air, that even silence was took ere she was ware, and wished she might deny her nature, and be never more, still to be so displaced. I was all ear, and took in strains that might create a soul under the ribs of death, but, oh, ere long, too well I did perceive it was the voice of my most honoured lady, your dear sister. Amazed I stood, harrowed with grief and fear, and, oh, poor hapless nightingale, thought I, how sweet thou singst, how near the deadly snare. Then down the lawns I ran with headlong haste, through paths and turnings, often trod by day, till, guided by mine ear, I found the place where that damned wizard, hid in sly disguise, for so by certain signs I knew, had met already, ere my best speed could prevent, the aidless, innocent lady his wished prey, who gently asked if he had seen such too, supposing him some neighbour villager. Longer I durst not stay, but soon I guessed ye were the two she meant. With that I sprung into swift flight till I had found you here, but further I know not. Second brother, O oh, night and shades, how are ye joined with hell in triple knot against the armed weakness of one virgin, alone and helpless? Is this the confidence you gave me, brother? Elder brother, yes, and keep it still. Lean on it safely. Not a period shall be unsaid for me. Against the threats of malice or of sorcery or that power which erring men call chance, this I hold firm. Virtue may be assailed, but never hurt, surprised by unjust force, but not enthralled. Yea, even that which mischief meant most harm shall in the happy trial prove most glory. But evil on itself shall back recoil and mix no more with goodness, when at last, gathered like scum and settled to itself, it shall be in eternal restless change self-fed and self-consumed. If this fail, the pillared firmament is rottenness, and earth's base built on stubble. But come, let's on, against the opposing will and arm of heaven, may never this just sword be lifted up, but for that damned magician, let him be girt with all the grisly legions that troop under the sooty flag of Acheron, harpies and hydras, or all the monstrous forms twixt Africa and Ind, I'll find him out and force him to restore his purchase back, or drag him by the curls to a foul death, cursed as his life. Spirit. Alas, good venturous youth, I love thy courage yet, and bold emprise, but here thy sword can do thee little stead. Far other arms and other weapons must be those that quell the might of hellish charms. He, with his bare wand, can unthread thy joints and crumble all thy sinews. Elder brother, why, prithee, shepherd, how durst thou then thyself approach so near as to make this relation? Spirit, care and utmost shifts how to secure the lady from surprisal brought to my mind a certain shepherd lad of small regard to see to, yet well skilled in every virtuous plant and healing herb that spreads her verdant leaf to the morning ray. He loved me well, and oft would beg me sing, which when I did, he on the tender grass would sit and hearken e'en to ecstasy, and in requital ope his leathern scrip and show me simples of a thousand names, telling their strange and vigorous faculties. Amongst the rest, a small, unsightly root, but of divine effect, he called me out. The leaf was darkish and had prickles on it, but in another country, as he said, bore a bright golden flower, but not in this soil, unknown and like esteemed, and the dull swain treads on it daily with his clouted shoon, and yet more medicinal is than that moly that Hermes once to wise Ulysses gave. He called it hymeny and gave it me, and bade me keep it as of sovereign use gainst all enchantments, mildew blast, or damp, or ghastly fury's apparition. I pursed it up, but little reckoning made, till now that this extremity compelled. But now I find it true, 
for by this means I knew the foul enchanter, though disguised, entered the very lime twigs of his spells, and yet came off. If you have this about you, as I will give you when we go, you may boldly assault the necromancer's hall, where, if he be, with dauntless hardihood and brandished blade, rush on him, break his glass, and shed the luscious liquor on the ground, but seize his wand, Though he and his cursed crew fear sign of battle make and menace high, or like the sons of Vulcan vomit smoke, yet will they soon retire, if he but shrink. Elder brother, Thursus, lead on apace, I'll follow thee, and some good angel bear a shield before us. The scene changes to a stately palace, set out with all manner of deliciousness, soft music, tables spread with all dainties, Comus appears with his rabble, and the lady set in an enchanted chair, to whom he offers his glass, which she puts by, and goes about to rise. Comus. Nay, lady, sit. If I but wave this wand, your nerves are all chained up in alablaster, and you a statue, or as Daphne was root-bound that fled Apollo. Lady. Fool, do not boast. Thou canst not touch the freedom of my mind with all thy charms, although this corporal rind thou hast immanacled, while heaven sees good. Thomas, why are you vexed, lady? Why do you frown? Here dwell no frowns nor anger. From these gates sorrow flies far. See? Here be all the pleasures that fancy can beget on youthful thoughts, when the fresh blood grows lively, and returns brisk as the April buds in primrose season. And first, behold this cordial julep here that flames and dances in his crystal bounds with spirits of balm and fragrant syrups mixed. Not that Nepenthes which the wife of Thone in Egypt gave to Jove-born Helena, is of such power to stir up joy as this, to life so friendly or so cool to thirst. Why should you be so cruel to yourself and to those dainty limbs, which nature lent for gentle usage and soft delicacy? But you invert the covenants of her trust, and harshly deal like an ill borrower with that which you received on other terms scorning the unexempt condition by which all mortal frailty must subsist refreshment after toil ease after pain that have been tired all day without repast and timely rest have wanted but fair virgin this will restore all soon lady twill not false traitor twill not restore the truth and honesty that thou hast banished from thy tongue with lies was this the cottage and the safe abode thou toldst me of? What grim aspects are these, these ugly-headed monsters? Mercy, guard me! Hence with thy brood enchantments, foul deceit! Hast thou betrayed my credulous innocence with visored falsehood and base forgery? And wouldst thou seek again to trap me here with licorice baits fit to ensnare a brute? Were it a draught for Juno when she banquets, I would not taste thy treasonous offer. None but such as our good men can give good things, and that which is not good is not delicious to a well-governed and wise appetite. Comus. Oh, foolishness of men that lend their ears to those budge doctors of the stoic fur and fetch their precepts from the cynic tub, praising the lean and sallow abstinence. Wherefore did nature pour her bounties forth with such a full and unwithdrawing hand, covering the earth with odors, fruits, and flocks, thronging the seas with spawn innumerable, but all to please and sate the curious taste, and set to work millions of spinning worms that in their green shops weave the smooth-haired silk to deck her sons, and that no corner might be vacant of her plenty, in her own loins she hutched all worshipped ore and precious gems to store her children with. If all the world should in a pet of temperance feed on pulse, 
drink the clear stream and nothing wear but freeze lawgiver would be unthanked would be unpraised not half his riches known and yet despised and we should serve him as a grudging master as a penurious niggard of his wealth and live like nature's bastards not her sons who would be quite surcharged with her own weight and strangle with her waste fertility the earth cumbered and the winged air darked with blooms the herds would over multitude their lords the sea or fraught would swell and the unsought diamonds would so emblaze the forehead of the deep and so bestead with stars that they below would grow inured to light and come at last to gaze upon the sun with shameless brows list lady be not coy and be not cousined with that same vaunted name virginity beauty is nature's coin must not be hoarded but must be current and the good thereof consists in mutual and partaken bliss unsavoury in the enjoyment of itself if you let slip time like a neglected rose it withers on the stalk with languished head beauty is nature's brag and must be shown in courts at feasts and high solemnities where most may wonder at the workmanship it is for homely features to keep home they have their name thence coarse complexions and cheeks of sorry grain will serve to ply the sampler and to tease the hussif's wool what need a vermil tinctured lip for that love darting eyes or tresses like the morn there was another meaning in these gifts think what and be advised you are but young yet lady i had not thought to have unlocked my lips in this unhallowed air but that this juggler would think to charm my judgment as mine eyes obtruding false rules pranked in reason's garb i hate when vice can bolt her arguments and virtue has no tongue to check her pride. Impostor, do not charge most innocent nature as if she would her children should be riotous with her abundance. She, good cateress, means her provision only to the good that live according to her sober laws and holy dictate of spare temperance. If every just man that now pines with want had but a moderate and beseeming share of that which lewdly pampered luxury now heaps upon some few with vast excess, nature's full blessings would be well dispensed in unsuperfluous even proportion, and she no whit encumbered with her store, and then the giver would be better thanked, his praise due paid, for swinish gluttony ne'er looks to heaven amidst his gorgeous feast but with besotted base ingratitude crams and blasphemes his feeder shall i go on or have i said enough to him that dares arm his profane tongue with contemptuous words against the sun-clad power of chastity fain i would something say yet to what end thou hast nor ear nor soul to apprehend the sublime notion and high mystery that must be uttered to unfold the sage and serious doctrine of virginity and thou art worthy that thou shouldst not know more happiness than this thy present lot enjoy your dear wit and gay rhetoric that hath so well been taught her dazzling fence thou art not fit to hear thyself convinced Yet should I try, the uncontrolled worth of this pure cause would kindle my rapt spirits to such a flame of sacred vehemence that dumb things would be moved to sympathize, and the brute earth would lend her nerves and shake till all thy magic structures reared so high were shattered into heaps o'er thy false head. Thomas, she fables not. I feel that I do fear her words set off by some superior power, and though not mortal, yet a cold shuddering dew dips me all o'er, as when the wrath of Jove speaks thunder with the chains of Erebus to some of Saturn's crew. I must dissemble and try her yet more strongly. Come, no more. This is mere moral babble. 
and direct against the canon laws of our foundation. I must not suffer this. Yet tis but the lees and settlings of a melancholy blood. But this will cure all straight. One sip of this will bathe the drooping spirits in delight beyond the bliss of dreams. Be wise and taste. The brothers rush in with swords drawn, wrest his glass out of his hand, and break it against the ground. His rout make sign of resistance, but are all driven in. The attendant spirit comes in. Spirit. What? Have you let the false enchanter scape? Oh, you mistook. You should have snatched his wand and bound him fast. Without his rod reversed and backward mutters of dissevering power, we cannot free the lady that sits here in stony fetters fixed and motionless. Yet stay, be not disturbed. I now bethink me some other means I have which may be used, which once of Melibius old I learnt the soothest shepherd that e'er piped on plains. There is a gentle nymph not far from hence that with moist curb sways the smooth severn stream. Sabrina is her name, a virgin pure. While on she was the daughter of Lucrine that had the scepter from his father brute, the guiltless damsel flying the mad pursuit of her enraged stepdam Gwendolen commended her fair innocence to the flood that stayed her flight with his cross-flowing course. The water-nymphs that in the bottom played held up their pearled wrists and took her in, bearing her straight to aged Nereus Hall, who, piteous of her woes, reared her lank head and gave her to his daughters to embathe in nectared lavers strewed with asphodel, and, through the porch and inlet of each sense, dropped in ambrosial oils till she revived and underwent a quick immortal change, made goddess of the river. Still she retains her maiden gentleness, and oft at eve visits the herds along the twilight meadows, helping all urchin blasts and ill-luck signs that the shrewd meddling elf delights to make, which she with precious vile liquors heals, for which the shepherds at their festivals carol her goodness loud in rustic lays, and throw sweet garland wreaths into her stream of pansies, pinks, and gaudy daffodils. And as the old swain said, she can unlock the clasping charms and thaw the numbing spell, if she be right invoked in warbled song. For maidenhood she loves, and will be swift to aid a virgin, such as was herself in hard besetting need. This will I try, and add the power of some adjuring verse. Song Sabrina, fair, listen where thou art sitting, under the glassy, cool, translucent wave, in twisted braids of lilies knitting the loose train of thy amber-dropping hair. Listen for dear honour's sake, goddess of the silver lake, listen and say. Listen and appear to us in name of great Oceanus, by the earth shaking Neptune's mace, and Thetis grave majestic pace, by hoary Nereus wrinkled look, and the Carpathian wizard's hook, by scaly Triton's winding shell, and old soothsaying Glaucus spell, by Leucothea's lovely hands, and her son that rules the strands, by Thetis tinsel slippered feet, and the songs of Siren sweet, by dead Parthenope's dear tomb, and fair Lygia's golden comb, wherewith she sits on diamond rocks, sleeking her soft alluring locks, by all the nymphs that nightly dance upon thy streams with wily glance, rise, rise, and heave thy rosy head from thy coral paven bed, and bridle in thy headlong wave till thou our summons answered have. Listen, and say. Sabrina rises, attended by water nymphs, and sings. Sabrina. By the rushy, fringed bank where grows the willow and the osier dank, my sliding chariot stays. Thick set with agate and the azure and sheen of turkis blue and emerald green that in the channel strays. 
whilst from off the waters fleet thus i set my printless feet o'er the cowslip's velvet head that bends not as i tread gentle swain at thy request i am here spirit goddess dear we implore thy powerful hand to undo the charmed band of true virgin here distressed through the force and through the wile of unblessed enchanter vile sabrina shepherd tis my office best to help in snared chastity brightest lady look on me thus i sprinkle on thy breast drops that from my fountain pure i have kept a precious cure thrice upon thy finger's tip thrice upon thy rubied lip next this marble venomed seat smeared with gums of glutinous heat i touch with chaste palms moist and cold now the spell hath lost his hold and i must haste ere morning hour to wait in amphrodite's bower sabrina descends and the lady rises out of her seat spirit virgin daughter of locrine sprung of old anchises line may thy brimmed waves for this their full tribute never miss from a thousand petty rills that tumble down the snowy hills summer drought or singed air never scorch thy tresses fair nor wet october's torrent flood thy molten crystal filled with mud may thy billows roll ashore the barrel and the golden ore may thy lofty head be crowned with many a tower and terrace round and here and there thy banks upon with groves of myrrh and cinnamon come lady while heaven lends us grace let us fly this cursed place lest the sorcerer us entice with some other new device not a waste or needless sound till we come to holier ground i shall be your faithful guide through this gloomy covert wide and not many furlongs thence is your father's residence where this night are met in state many a friend to gratulate his wished presence and beside all the swains that there abide with jigs and rural dance resort we shall catch them at their sport and our sudden coming there will double all their mirth and cheer come let us haste the stars grow high but night sits monarch yet in the mid sky the scene changes presenting ludlow town and the president castle then come in country dancers after them the attendant spirit with the two brothers and the lady song spirit back shepherds back enough your play till next sunshine holiday here be without duck or nod other trippings to be trod of lighter toes and such court guise as mercury did first devise with the mincing dryades on the lawns and on the leaves this second song presents them to their father and mother noble lord and lady bright i have brought ye new delight here behold so goodly grown three fair branches of your own heaven hath timely tried their youth their faith their patience and their truth and sent them here through hard essays with a crown of deathless praise to triumph in victorious dance for sensual folly and intemperance the dance is ended the spirit epilogizes spirit to the ocean now i fly and those happy climes that lie where day never shuts his eye up in the broad fields of the sky there i suck the liquid air all amidst the gardens fair of hesperus and his daughters three that sing about the golden tree along the crisped shades and bowers revels the spruce and jocund spring the graces and the rosy-bosomed hours thither all their bounties bring that there eternal summer dwells and west winds with musky wing about the cedarn alleys fling nard and cassia's balmy smells iris there with humid bow waters the odorous banks that blow flowers of more mingled hue than her purple scarf can shew and drenches with elysian dew 
list mortals if your ears be true beds of hyacinth and roses where young adonis oft reposes waxing well of his deep wound in slumber soft and on the ground sadly sits the syrian queen but far above in spangled sheen celestial cupid her famed son advanced holds his dear psyche sweet entranced after her wandering labours long till free consent the gods among make her his eternal bride and from her fair unspotted side two blissful twins are to be born youth and joy so jove hath sworn but now my task is smoothly done i can fly or i can run quickly to the green earth's end where the bold welcome slow doth bend and from thence can soar as soon to the corners of the moon. Mortals that would follow me, love virtue, she alone is free. She can teach ye how to climb higher than the sphery chime. Or, if virtue feeble were, heaven itself would stoop to her. Notes 43. Ye, you, in 1673. 167, omitted, 1673. 168, 9, thus, 1637, manuscript reads, But here she comes, I fairly step aside, and hearken, if I may, her business here. 1673 reads, And hearken, if I may, her business here, but here she comes, I fairly step aside. 474, sensuality, sensuality, 1673. Manuscript also reads sensuality, as the meter requires. 493. Father. So also 1673. Manuscript reads fathers. 547. Meditate. Meditate upon 1673. 553. Drowsy frighted. Manuscript reads drowsy flighted. 556. Steam, stream, 1673. 580, further, further, 1673. 743, in the manuscript, which reads, If you let slip time like an neglected rose, a circle has been drawn around the and, but probably not by Milton. 780, enough, and now, 1673. End of a mask. On the Death of a Fair Infant Dying of a Cough by John Milton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland. This is the first of the poems added in the 1673 edition. Written in the 17th year of the poet's life. Anuitatis 17. On the death of a fair infant dying of a cough. O oh, fairest flower, no sooner blown but blasted, Soft silken primrose fading timelessly. Summer's chief honour, if thou hadst outlasted Bleak winter's force that made thy blossom dry. For he, being amorous on that lovely dye That did thy cheek and vermil, thought to kiss, But killed, alas, and then bewailed his fatal bliss. For since grim Aquila of his charioteer by boisterous rape the Athenian damsel got, he thought it touched his deity full near, if likewise he some fair one wedded not, thereby to wipe away the infamous lot of long uncoupled bed and childless eld, which amongst the wanton gods a foul reproach was held. So, Mounting up in icy pearled car, through middle empire of the freezing air he wandered long, till thee he spied from far. There ended was his quest, there ceased his care. Down he descended from his snow-soft chair, but all unwares with his cold kind embrace, unhoused thy virgin soul from her fair biting place. Yet art thou not inglorious in thy fate? For so Apollo, with unweeting hand, Whilom did slay his dearly loved mate young Hyacinth, 
born on Eurotas' strand. Young Hyacinth, the pride of Spartan land, but then transformed him to a purple flower. Alack, that so to change thee, winter had no power. Yet can I not persuade me thou art dead, or that thy course corrupts in earth's dark womb, or that thy beauties lie in wormy bed, hid from the world in a low delved tomb. Could heaven for pity thee so strictly doom? Oh, no, for something in thy face did shine above mortality that showed thou wast divine. Resolve me then, O soul, most surely blessed, if so it be that thou these plaints dost hear. Tell me, bright spirit, for e'er thou hoverest, whether above that high first moving sphere, or in the Elysian fields, if such there were. O oh, say me true, if thou wert mortal white, and why from us so quickly thou didst take thy flight? Wert thou some star, which from the ruined roof of shaped Olympus by mischance didst fall, which careful Jove in nature's true behoof took up, and in fit place did reinstall? Or did of late earth's sons besiege the wall of sheeny heaven, and thou some goddess fled amongst us here below to hide thy nectared head? Or wert thou that just maid who once before forsook the hated earth, Oh, tell me, sooth, and camest again to visit us once more. Or wert thou that sweet, smiling youth, or that crowned matron, sage, white-robed truth, or any other of that heavenly brood let down in cloudy throne to do the world some good? Note, 53, Or wert thou, or wert thou mercy, conjectured by John Heskin, Christ Church, Oxford University. From Ode on Nativity, stanza 15. Or wert thou of the golden-winged host, who, having clad thyself in human weed, to earth from thy prefixed seat didst post, and after short abode, fly back with speed, as if to show what creatures heaven doth breed, thereby to set the hearts of men on fire, to scorn the sordid world, and unto heaven aspire. But, oh, why didst thou not stay here below to bless us with thy heaven-loved innocence, to slake his wrath whom sin hath made our foe, to turn swift rushing black perdition hence, or drive away the slaughtering pestilence, to stand twixt us and our deserved smart? But thou canst best perform that office where thou art. Then thou the mother of so sweet a child, her false imagined loss cease to lament, and wisely learn to curb thy sorrows wild. Think what a present thou to God hast sent, and render him with patience what he lent. This, if thou do, he will an offspring give that till the world's last end shall make thy name to live. End of On a Fair Infant Dying of a Cough Edification Exercise by John Milton This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Thomas Copeland In the nineteenth year of his age, Anno Aetatis, nineteen, Edification Exercise in the College, Part Latin, Part English. The Latin speech is ended, the English thus began. Hail, native language, that by sinews weak didst move my first endeavouring tongue to speak, and madest imperfect words with childish trips half unpronounced slide through my infant lips, driving dumb silence from the portal door where he had mutely sate two years before. Here I salute thee, and thy pardon ask that now I use thee in my latter task. Small loss it is that thence can come unto thee. I know my tongue, but little grace can do thee. Thou needst not be ambitious to be first. Believe me, I have thither packed the worst, and if it happen, as I did forecast, the daintiest dishes shall be served up last. 
I pray thee then, deny me not thy aid for this same small neglect that I have made, but haste thee straight to do me once a pleasure, and from thy wardrobe bring thy chiefest treasure. Not those new-fangled toys a trimming slight, which takes our late fantastics with delight, but cull those richest robes and gayest attire, which deepest spirits and choicest wits desire. I have some naked thoughts that rove about, and loudly knock to have their passage out. And, weary of their place, do only stay till thou hast decked them in thy best array, that so they may without suspect or fears fly swiftly to this fair assembly's ears. Yet I had rather, if I were to choose, thy service in some graver subject use, such as may make thee search thy coffers round before thou clothe my fancy in fit sound, such where the deep transported mind may soar above the wheeling poles and at heaven's door look in and see each blissful deity how he before the thunderous throne doth lie listening to what unshorn apollo sings to the touch of golden wires while hebe brings immortal nectar to her kingly sire then passing through the spheres of watchful fire and misty regions of wide air next under and hills of snow and lofts of pilot thunder may tell at length how green-eyed Neptune raves, in heaven's defiance mustering all his waves. Then sing of secret things that came to pass when Beldam nature in her cradle was. And last, of kings and queens and heroes old, such as the wise Demodocus once told in solemn songs at King Alcinous' feast, while sad Ulysses' soul and all the rest are held with his melodious harmony in willing chains and sweet captivity but fie my wandering muse how thou dost stray expectance calls thee now another way thou knowst it must be now thy only bent to keep in compass of thy predicament then quick about thy purposed business come that to the next i may resign my room then ames is represented as father of the predicaments his ten sons whereof the eldest stood for substance with his canons, which Ains thus speaking explains. Good luck befriend thee, son, for at thy birth the fairy ladies danced upon the hearth. Thy drowsy nurse hath sworn she did them spy come tripping to the room where thou didst lie, and sweetly singing round about thy bed, strew all their blessings on thy sleeping head. She heard them give thee this, that thou shouldst still from eyes of mortals walk invisible. Yet there is something that doth force my fear, for once it was my dismal hap to hear a sibyl old, bow bent with crooked age, that far events full wisely could presage, and in time's long and dark perspective glass foresaw what future days should bring to pass. Your son, said she, nor can you it prevent, shall subject be to many an accident. O'er all his brethren he shall reign as king, yet every one shall make him underling, and those that cannot live from him asunder ungratefully shall strive to keep him under. In worth and excellence he shall outgo them, yet being above them he shall be below them. From others he shall stand in need of nothing, yet on his brothers shall depend for clothing. To find a foe, it shall not be his hap, and peace shall lull him in her flowery lap. Yet shall he live in strife, and at his door devouring war shall never cease to roar. Yea, it shall be his natural property to harbor those that are at enmity. What power, what force, what mighty spell, if not your learned hands, can loose this Gordian knot? The next, quantity and quality, spake in prose. Then relation was called by his name. Rivers, arise! Whether thou be the son of utmost Tweed, or Ooze, or Gulfy Dun, or Trent, who, like some earth-born giant, spreads his thirty arms along the indented meads, or sullen mole that runneth underneath, or seven swift guilty of maiden's death 
or rocky avon or of sedgy lee or coley tyne or ancient hallowed dee or humber loud that keeps the scythian's name or medway smooth or royal towered tail the rest was prose end of at a vacation exercise miscellaneous poems by john milton this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by thomas copeland the fifth ode of horace book one quis multa gracilis te pueri nulsa rendered almost word for word without rhyme according to the latin measure as near as the language permit what slender youth bedewed with liquid odours courts thee on roses in some pleasant cave hera for whom bindst thou in wreaths thy golden hair plain in thy neatness oh how oft shall he on faith and changed gods complain and seas rough with black winds and storms unwanted shall admire who now enjoys thee credulous all gold who always vacant always amiable hopes thee of flattering gales unmindful hapless they to whom thou untried seemst fair me in my vowed picture the sacred wall declares to have hung my dank and dropping weeds to the stern god of sea the latin text follows sonnets eleven a book was writ of late called tetracordum and woven close both matter form and style the subject new it walked the town a while numbering good intellects now seldom bored on cries the stall reader bless us what a word on a title page is this and some in file stand spelling false while one might walk to mile end green why is it harder sirs than gordon colchito or macdonald or galasp those rugged names to our like mouths grow sleek that would have made quintilian stare and gasp thy age like ours o solo sir john cheek hated not learning worse than toad or asp when thou taught'st cambridge and king edward greek note cambridge autograph supplies title on the detraction which followed my writing certain treatises twelve on the same i did but prompt the age to quit their clogs by the known rules of ancient liberty when straight a barbarous noise environs me of owls and cuckoos asses apes and dogs as when those hinds that were transformed to frogs railed at latona's twin-born progeny which after held the sun and moon in fee but this is got by casting pearl to hogs that bawl for freedom in their senseless mood and still revolt when truth would set them free license they mean when they cry liberty for who loves that must first be wise and good but from that mark how far they rove we see for all this waste of wealth and loss of blood thirteen to mr h laws on his heirs harry whose tuneful and well-measured song first taught our english music how to span words with just note and accent not to scan with midas ears committing short and long thy worth and skill exempts thee from the throng with praise enough for envy to look wan to after age thou shalt be writ the man that with smooth air couldst humour best our tongue thou honourest verse and verse must send her wing to honour thee the priest of phoebus choir that tunes their happiest lines in hymn or story dante shall give fame leave to set thee higher than his casella whom he wooed to sing met in the milder shades of purgatory Note nine send lend cambridge autograph manuscript fourteen when faith and love which parted from thee never 
had ripened thy just soul to dwell with God, meekly thou didst resign this earthly load of death called life, which us from life doth sever. Thy works and alms and all thy good endeavour stayed not behind, nor in the grave were trod, but as faith pointed with her golden rod followed thee up to joy and bliss for ever. Love led them on, and faith, who knew them best thy handmaids, clad them o'er with purple beams and azure wings, that up they flew so dressed, and spake the truth of thee on glorious themes before the judge, who thenceforth bid thee rest and drink thy fill of pure immortal streams. Note, Cambridge Autograph supplies title on the religious memory of Catherine Thompson, my Christian friend, deceased 16 December 1646. 15. On the late massacre in Piedmont. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold, even them who kept thy truth so pure of old when all our fathers worshipped stocks and stones forget not. In thy book record their groans who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled mother with infant down the rocks. Their moans the bales redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. Their martyred blood and ashes sow o'er all the Italian fields, where still doth sway the triple tyrant, that from these may grow a hundredfold, who, having learnt thy way, early may fly the Babylonian woe. 16. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that own talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, though my soul were bent to sarve there with my maker, and present my true account, lest he return and chide, doth God exact day labour light denied, I fondly ask. But patience to prevent that murmur soon replies. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke? They serve him best. His state is kingly. Thousands at his bidden speed and post or land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. 17. Lawrence, a virtuous father, virtuous son, now that the fields are dank and ways are mire, where shall we sometimes meet, and by the fire help waste a sullen day, what may be won from the hard season gaining? Time will run on smoother, till Vivonius re-inspire the frozen earth, and clothe in fresh attire the lily and rose, that neither sowed nor spun. What neat repast shall feast us, light and choice, of attic taste, with wine, whence we may rise to hear the lute well touched, or artful voice, warble immortal notes and Tuscan air? He who of those delights can judge and spare to interpose them oft is not unwise. 18. Syriac whose grandsire on the royal bench of British Temus, with no mean applause pronounced, and in his volumes taught our laws, which others at their bar so often wrench. Today deep thoughts resolve with me to drench in mirth, that after no repenting draws. Let Euclid rest and Archimedes pause, and what the Swede intend and what the French. To measure life learn thou betimes, and know towards solid good what leads the nearest way. For other things mild heaven a time ordains, and disapproves that care, though wise in show, that with superfluous burden loads the day, and when God sends a cheerful hour, refrains. 19. Methought I saw my late espoused saint brought to me like Alcestis from the grave whom Jove's great son to her glad husband gave, 
rescued from death by force, though pale and faint. Mine, as whom washed from spot of childbed taint, purification in the old law did save, and such as yet once more I trust to have full sight of her in heaven without restraint, came vested all in white, pure as her mind. Her face was veiled, yet to my fancied sight, love, sweetness, goodness, in her person shined so clear as in no face with more delight. But, oh, as to embrace me she inclined, I waked, she fled, and day brought back my night. On the new forces of conscience under the long parliament. Because you have thrown off your prelate lord, and with stiff vows renounced his liturgy, to seize the widowed whore plurality from those whose sin ye envied, not abhorred, Dare ye for this adjure the civil sword to force our consciences, that Christ set free, and ride us with a classic hierarchy taught ye by mere A.S. and Rutherford? Men whose life, learning, faith, and pure intent would have been held in high esteem with Paul must now be named and printed heretics by shallow Edwards and Scotch what you call. But we do hope to find out all your tricks, your plots and packing, worse than those of Trent, that so the Parliament may, with their wholesome and preventive shears, clip your phylacteries, though balk your ears, and succour our just fears, when they shall read this clearly in your charge, New Presbyter is but old priest, writ large. The four following sonnets were not published until 1694, and then in a mangled form by Phillips, in his Life of Milton. They are here printed from the Cambridge Manuscript, where that to Fairfax is in Milton's autograph. On the Lord General Fairfax at the Siege of Colchester. Fairfax, whose name in arms through Europe rings, filling each mouth with envy or with praise, and all her jealous monarchs with amaze, and rumours loud that daunt remotest kings, thy firm unshaken virtue ever brings victory home, though new rebellions raise their hydra heads, and the false north displays her broken league to imp their serpent wings. O oh, yet a nobler task awaits thy hand. Yet what can war but endless war still breed, till truth and right from violence be freed? and public faith cleared from the shameful brand of public fraud. In vain doth the valour bleed, while avarice and rapine share the land. To the Lord General Cromwell, May 1652. On the proposals of certain ministers at the Committee for Propagation of the Gospel. Cromwell, our chief of men, who through a cloud not a war only but detractions rude, guided by faith and matchless fortitude, to peace and truth thy glorious way hast ploughed, and on the neck of crowned fortune proud hast reared God's trophies and his works pursued, while Darwin's stream with blood of Scots imbrued and Dunbar field resounds thy praises loud, and Worcester's laureate reap. Yet much remains to conquer still. Peace hath her victories no less renowned than war. New foes arise, threatening to bind our souls with secular chains. Help us to save free conscience from the paw of hireling wolves, whose gospel is their maw. To Sir Henry Vane the Younger Vane, young in years, but in sage counsel old, than whom a better senator ne'er held the helm of Rome, when gowns, not arms, repelled the fierce of pirate and the African bold. Whether to settle peace or to unfold the drift of hollow states, hard to be spelled, then to advise how war may best, upheld, moved by her two main nerves, iron and gold, in all her equipage, besides to know both spiritual power and civil, 
what each means, what severs each, thou hast learned, which few have done. The bounds of either sword to thee we owe. Therefore, on thy firm hand religion leans in peace, and reckons thee her eldest son. To Mr. Syriac Skinner, upon his blindness. Syriac, this three years' day, these eyes, though clear to outward view of blemish or of spot, bereft of light, their seeing have forgot. Nor to their idle orbs doth sight appear of sun or moon or star throughout the year, O man or woman. Yet I argue not against heaven's hand or will, nor bate a jot of heart or hope, but still bear up and steer right onward. What supports me, dost thou ask? The conscience, friend, to've lost them overplied in liberty's defence, my noble task, of which all Europe talks from side to side. This thought might lead me through the world's vain mask, content, though blind, had I no better guide. Psalm 1, done into verse, 1653. Blessed is the man who hath not walked astray in counsel of the wicked, and the way of sinners hath not stood, and in the seat of scorners hath not sate. But in the great Jehovah's law is ever his delight, and in his law he studies day and night. He shall be as a tree which planted grows by watery streams, and in his season knows to yield his fruit, and his leaf shall not fall and what he takes in hand shall prosper all. Not so the wicked, but as chaff which fan the wind drives, so the wicked shall not stand in judgment, or abide their trial then, nor sinners in the assembly of just men. For the Lord knows the upright way of the just, and the way of bad men to ruin must. Psalm 2 Done August 8, 1653. Terzetti. Why do the Gentiles tumult, and the nations muse a vain thing? The kings of the earth upstand with power, and princes in their congregations lay deep their plots together through each land, against the Lord and his Messiah dear. Let us break off, say they, by strength of hand their bonds, and cast from us no more to wear their twisted cords. He who in heaven doth dwell shall laugh. The Lord shall scoff them. Then, severe, speak to them in his wrath, and in his fell and fierce ire trouble them. But I, saith he, anointed of my king, though ye rebel, on Sion my whole hill, a firm decree I will declare. The Lord to me hath said, Thou art my son. I have begotten thee this day. Ask of me and the grant is made. As thy possession, I on thee bestow thee even, and as thy conquest to be swayed earth's utmost bounds, them shalt thou bring full low with iron scepter bruised, and them disperse like to a potter's vessel shivered so. And now be wise at length, ye kings of earth, be taught, ye judges of the earth, with fear Jehovah serve, and let your joy converse with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he appear in anger, and ye perish in the way. If once his wrath take fire like fuel seer, happy all those who have him in their stay. Psalm 3, August 9, 1653 when he fled from Absalom. Lord, how many are my foes! How many those that in arms against me rise! Many are they that of my life distrustfully thus say, No help for him in God there lies. But thou, Lord, art my shield, my glory. Thee, through my story, the exalter of my head I count. Aloud I cried unto Jehovah, He full soon replied, and heard me from his holy mount. I lay and slept, I waked again, for my sustain was the Lord. Of many millions the populous rout I fear not, 
though in camping round about they pitch against me their pavilions. Rise, Lord, save me, my God, for thou hast smote ere now on the cheekbone all my foes, of men abhorred hast broke the teeth. This help was from the Lord, thy blessing on thy people flows. Psalm 4, August 10th, 1653 Answer me when I call God of my righteousness. In straits and in distress thou didst me disenthrall and set at large. Now spare, now pity me, and hear my earnest prayer. Great ones, how long will ye my glory have in scorn? How long be thus forlorn still to love vanity? To love, to seek, to prize things false and vain, and nothing else but lies. Yet know the Lord hath chose, chose to himself apart, the good and meek of heart, for whom to choose he knows. Jehovah from on high will hear my voice, what time to him I cry. Be awed and do not sin, speak to your hearts alone, upon your beds each one, and be at peace within. Offer the offerings just of righteousness, and in Jehovah trust. Many there be that say, who yet will show us good, talking like this world's brood? But, Lord, thus let me pray. On us lift up the light, lift up the favor of thy countenance bright. Into my heart more joy and gladness thou hast put than when a year of glut their stores doth overcloy, and from their plenteous grounds with vast increase their corn and wine abounds. In peace at once will I both lay me down and sleep, for thou alone dost keep me safe where'er I lie, as in a rocky cell. Thou, Lord, alone in safety makest me dwell. Psalm 5, August 12th, 1653 Jehovah, to my words give ear, my meditation weigh, the voice of my complaining hear, my King and God, for unto thee I pray. Jehovah, thou my early voice shalt in the morning hear. Is morning I to thee with choice will rank my prayers, and watch till thou appear. For thou art not a God that takes in wickedness delight. Evil with thee no biding makes. Fools or madmen stand not within thy sight. All workers of iniquity thou wilt destroy, that speak a lie, the bloody and guileful man God doth detest. But I will in thy mercies, dear, thy numerous mercies, go into thy house. I in thy fear will towards thy holy temple worship low. Lord, lead me in thy righteousness. Lead me, because of those that do observe of I transgress. Set thy ways right before where my step goes. For in his faltering mouth unstable no word is firm or sooth. There inside troubles miserable. An open grave their throat, their tongue they smooth. God find them guilty, let them fall by their own counsels quelled. Push them in their own rebellions all still on. For against thee they have rebelled. Then all who trust in thee shall bring their joy, while thou from blame defendst them. They shall ever sing and shall triumph in thee, who love thy name. For thou, Jehovah, wilt be found to bless the just man still, as with a shield thou wilt surround him with thy lasting favor and good will. Psalm 6, August 13th, 1653 Lord, in thine anger do not reprehend me, nor in thy hot displeasure me correct. Pity me, Lord, for I am much deject, am very weak and faint. Heal and amend me, for all my bones that even with anguish ache are troubled. Yea, my soul is troubled sore, and thou, O Lord, how long? Turn, Lord, restore my soul, O save me for thy goodness' sake. For in death no remembrance is of thee. Who in the grave can celebrate thy praise? Wearied I am with sighing out my days. Nightly my couch I make a kind of sea, my bed I water with my tears, mine eye through grief consumes, 
is waxen old and dark in the midst of all mine enemies that mar depart all ye that work iniquity depart from me for the voice of my weeping the lord hath heard the lord hath heard my prayer my supplication with acceptance fair the lord will own and have me in his keeping mine enemies shall all be blank and dashed with much confusion then grow red with shame they shall return in haste the way they came and in a moment shall be quite abashed psalm 7 august 14th 1653 upon the words of cush the benjamite against him lord my god to thee I fly, save me and secure me under thy protection while I cry, lest as a lion, and no wonder, he haste to tear my soul asunder, tearing and no rescue nigh. Lord my God, if I have thought or done this, if wickedness be in my hands, if I have wrought ill to him that meant me peace, or to him have rendered less, and not freed my foe for naught, let the enemy pursue my soul and overtake it. Let him tread my life down to the earth and roll in the dust my glory dead, in the dust, and there outspread lodge it with dishonor foul. Rise, Jehovah, in thine ire. Rouse thyself amidst the rage of my foes that urge like fire, and wake for me their furious wage. Judgment here thou didst engage and command which I desire. So the assemblies of each nation will surround thee seeking right. Thence to thy glorious habitation return on high and in their sight. Jehovah judgeth most upright all people from the world's foundation. Judge me, Lord, be judge in this, according to my righteousness and the innocence which is upon me. Cause at length to cease of evil men the wickedness and their power that do amiss. But the just establish fast, since thou art the just God that tries hearts and reigns. On God is cast my defense, and in him lies, in him who, both just and wise, saves the upright of heart at last. God is a just judge and severe, and God is every day offended. If the unjust will not forbear, his sword he whets, his bow hath bended already, and for him intended the tools of death that waits him near. His arrows purposely made he for them that persecute. Behold, he travels big with vanity. Trouble he hath conceived of old as in a womb, and from that mould hath at length brought forth a lie. He digged a pit, and delved it deep, and fell into the pit he made. His mischief, that due course doth keep, turns on his head, and his ill trade of violence will undelayed fall on his crown with ruin steep. Then will I Jehovah's praise according to his justice raise, and sing the name and deity of Jehovah the Most High. Psalm 8 August 14, 1653. O Jehovah our Lord, how wondrous great and glorious is thy name through all the earth! So, as above the heavens thy praise to set, out of the tender mouths of latest birth, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, thou hast founded strength because of all thy foes, to stint the enemy and slack the vengers' brow, that bends his rage thy providence to oppose. When I behold thy heavens, thy fingers art, the moon and stars which thou so bright hast set in the pure firmament, then saith my heart, O oh, what is man that thou rememberest yet, and thinkst upon him, or of man begot, that him thou visitst, and of him art found, scarce to be less than gods thou madest his lot with honour and with state thou hast him crowned or the works of thy hand thou madest him lord thou hast put all under his lordly feet all flocks and herds by thy commanding word all beasts that in the field or forest meet 
fowl of the heavens and fish that through the wet sea paths in shoals do slide and know no dearth o jehovah our lord how wondrous great and glorious is thy name through all the earth april sixteen forty eight j m nine of the psalms done into metre wherein all but what is in a different character are the very words of the text translated from the original psalm eighty thou shepherd that dost israel keep give ear in time of need who leadest like a flock of sheep thy loved joseph seed that sitst between the cherubs bright between their wings outspread shine forth and from thy cloud give light and on our foes thy dread in ephraim's view and benjamin's and in manasseh's sight awake thy strength come and be seen to save us by thy might turn us again thy grace divine to us o god vouchsafe cause thou thy face on us to shine and then we shall be safe lord god of hosts how long wilt thou, how long wilt thou declare thy smoking wrath and angry brow against thy people's prayer? Thou feedst them with the bread of tears, their bread with tears they eat, and makes them largely drink the tears wherewith their cheeks are wet. A strife thou makest us, and a prey to every neighbor foe. Among themselves they laugh, they play, and flouts us as they throw. Return us, and thy grace divine, O God of hosts, vouchsafe. Cause thou thy face on us to shine, and then we shall be safe. A vine from Egypt thou hast brought, thy free love made it thine, and drovest out nations proud and hot to plant this lovely vine. Thou didst prepare for it a place, and root it deep and fast, that it began to grow apace and filled the land at last with her green shade that covered all the hills were overspread her boughs as high as cedars tall advanced their lofty head her branches on the western side down to the sea she sent and upward to that river wide her other branches went why hast thou laid her hedges low and broken down her fence that all may pluck her as they go with rudest violence. The tusked boar out of the wood upturns it by the roots, wild beasts their brows and make their food her grapes and tender shoots. Return now, God of hosts, look down from heaven thy seat divine. Behold us, but without a frown, and visit this thy vine. Visit this vine which thy right hand hath set and planted long and the young branch that for thyself thou hast made firm and strong. But now it is consumed with fire and cut with axes down. They perish at thy dreadful ire, at thy rebuke and frown. Upon the man of thy right hand let thy good hand be laid, upon the son of man whom thou strong for thyself hast made. So shall we not go back from thee to ways of sin and shame. Quicken us thou, then gladly we shall call upon thy name. Return us, and thy grace divine, Lord God of hosts, vouchsafe. Cause thou thy face on us to shine, and then we shall be safe. Psalm 81 To God our strength sing loud and clear. Sing loud to God our King. To Jacob's God, that all may hear, loud acclamations ring. Prepare a hymn, prepare a song, the timbrel hither bring, the cheerful psaltery bring along, and harp with pleasant string. Blow as is wont in the new moon with trumpet's lofty sound, the pointed time, the day whereon our solemn feast comes round. This was a statute given of old for Israel to observe, a law of Jacob's God to hold, from whence they might not swerve. This he a testimony ordained in Joseph not to change, when, as he passed through Egypt's land, the tongue I heard was strange. From burden and the slavish toil I set his shoulder free, 
his hands from pots and miry soil delivered were by me when trouble did thee sore assail on me then didst thou call and i to free thee did not fail and led thee out of thrall i answered thee in thunder deep with clouds encompassed round i tried thee at the water steep of meribah renowned hear o my people hearken well i testify to thee thou ancient flock of israel if thou wilt list to me throughout the land of thy abode no alien god shall be nor shalt thou to a foreign god in honour bend thy knee i am the lord thy god which brought thee out of egypt land ask large enough and i besought will grant thy full demand and yet my people would not hear nor hearken to my voice and israel whom i loved so dear misliked me for his choice then did i leave them to their will and to their wandering mind their own conceits they followed still their own devices blind oh that my people would be wise to serve me all their days and oh that israel would advise to walk my righteous ways then would i soon bring down their foes that now so proudly rise and turn my hand against all those that are their enemies who hate the lord should then be fain to bow to him and bend but they his should remain their time should have no end and he would free them from the shock with flour of finest wheat and satisfy them from the rock with honey for their meat psalm eighty two god in the great assembly stands of kings and lordly states among the gods on both his hands he judges and debates how long will ye pervert the right with judgment false and wrong favoring the wicked by your might who thence grow bold and strong regard the weak and fatherless dispatch the poor man's cause and raise the man in deep distress by just and equal laws defend the poor and desolate and rescue from the hands of wicked men the low estate of him that help demands they know not nor will understand in darkness they walk on the earth's foundations all are moved and out of order gone i said that ye were gods yea all the sons of god most high but ye shall die like men and fall as other princes die rise god judge thou the earth in might this wicked earth redress for thou art he who shalt by right the nations all possess psalm eighty three be not thou silent now at length o god hold not thy peace sit not thou still o god of strength we cry and do not cease for lo thy furious foes now swell and storm outrageously and they that hate thee proud and fell exalt their heads full high against thy people they contrive their plots and counsels deep them to ensnare they chiefly strive whom thou dost hide and keep come let us cut them off say they till they no nation be that israel's name for ever may be lost in memory for they consult with all their might and all as one in mind themselves against thee they unite and in firm union bind the tents of edom and the brood of scornful ishmael moab with them of hagar's blood that in the desert dwell jival and ammon there conspire and hateful amalek the philistines and they of tyre whose bounds the sea doth check with them great ashur also bands and doth confirm the knot all these have lent their armed hands to aid the sons of lot do to them as to midian bold that wasted all the coast to sisera and as is told thou didst to jabin's host when at the brook of kishon old they were repulsed and slain and endor quite cut off and rolled as dung upon the plain as zeb and oreb evil sped so let their princes speed as Zeba and Zalmunna bled, so let their princes bleed. 
for they amidst their pride have said by right now shall we seize god's houses and will now invade their stately palaces my god O oh, make them as a wheel no quiet let them find giddy and restless let them reel like stubble from the wind as when an aged wood takes fire which on a sudden strays the greedy flame runs higher and higher till all the mountains blaze so with thy whirlwind them pursue and with thy tempest chase and till they yield thee honour due lord fill with shame their face ashamed and troubled let them be troubled and shamed for ever ever confounded and so die with shame and scape it never then shall they know that thou whose name jehovah is alone art the most high and thou the same or all the earth art one psalm eighty four how lovely are thy dwellings fair o lord of hosts how dear the pleasant tabernacles are where thou dost dwell so near my soul doth long and almost die thy courts o lord to see my heart and flesh aloud do cry o living god for thee there even the sparrow freed from wrong hath found a house of rest the swallow there to lay her young hath built her brooding nest even by thy altars lord of hosts they find their safe abode and home they fly from round the coasts toward thee my king my god happy who in thy house reside where thee they ever praise happy who strength in thee doth bide and in their hearts thy ways they pass through baca's thirsty vale that dry and barren ground as through a fruitful watery dale where springs and showers abound they journey on from strength to strength with joy and gladsome cheer till all before our god at length in sion do appear lord god of hosts hear now my prayer o jacob's god give ear thou god our shield look on the face of thy anointed dear for one day in thy courts to be is better and more blessed than in the joys of vanity a thousand days at best i in the temple of my god had rather keep a door than dwell in tents and rich abode with sin for evermore for god the lord both sun and shield gives grace and glory bright no good from him shall be withheld whose ways are just and right lord god of hosts that reignst on high that man is truly blessed who only on thee doth rely and in thee only rest psalm eighty five thy land to favour graciously thou hast not lord been slack thou hast from hard captivity returned jacob back the iniquity thou didst forgive that wrought thy people woe and all their sin that did thee grieve hast hid where none shall know thine anger all thou hadst removed and calmly didst return from thy fierce wrath which we had proved far worse than fire to burn god of our saving health and peace turn us and us restore thine indignation cause to cease toward us and chide no more wilt thou be angry without end for ever angry thus wilt thou thy frowning ire extend from age to age on us wilt thou not turn and hear our voice and us again revive that so thy people may rejoice by thee preserved alive cause us to see thy goodness lord to us thy mercy shew thy saving health to us afford and life in us renew and now what god the lord will speak i will go straight and hear for to his people he speaks peace, and to his saints full dear. To his dear saints he will speak peace, but let them never more return to folly, but so cease to trespass as before. Surely to such as do him fear, salvation is at hand, and glory shall ere long appear to dwell within our land. Mercy and truth that long were missed, now joyfully are met, sweet peace and righteousness have kissed 
and hand in hand are set. Truth from the earth, like to a flower, shall bud and blossom then, and justice from her heavenly bower look down on mortal men. The Lord will also then bestow whatever thing is good. Our land shall forth in plenty throw her fruits to be our food. Before him righteousness shall go, his royal harbinger. Then will he come, and not be slow, his footsteps cannot err. Psalm 86 Thy gracious ear, O Lord, incline. O hear me, I thee pray. For I am poor and almost pine with need and sad decay. Preserve my soul, for I have trod thy ways and love the just. Save thou thy servant, O my God, who still in thee doth trust. Pity me, Lord, for daily thee I call. O make rejoice thy servant's soul. For, Lord, to thee I lift my soul and voice. For thou art good. Thou, Lord, art prone to pardon. Thou to all art full of mercy. Thou alone, to them that on thee call. Unto my supplication, Lord, give ear, and to the cry of my incessant prayers afford thy hearing graciously. I, in the day of my distress, will call on thee for aid, for thou wilt grant me free access and answer what I prayed. Like thee among the gods is none, O Lord, nor any works of all that other gods have done like to thy glorious works. The nations all whom thou hast made shall come, and all shall frame to bow them low before thee, Lord, and glorify thy name. For great thou art, and wonders great by thy strong hand are done. Thou in thy everlasting seat remainest God alone. Teach me, O Lord, thy way most right. I in thy truth will bide. To fear thy name my heart unite, so shall it never slide. Thee will I praise, O Lord my God, Thee honour and adore with my whole heart, And blaze abroad Thy name for evermore. For great Thy mercy is toward me, And Thou hast freed my soul, Even from the lowest hell set free, From deepest darkness foul. O God, the proud against me rise, And violent men are met to seek my life, And in their eyes no fear of Thee have set. But thou, Lord, art the God most mild, readiest thy grace to shew, slow to be angry, and art styled most merciful, most true. O turn to me thy face at length, and me have mercy on. Unto thy servant give thy strength, and save thy handmaid son. Some sign of good to me afford, and let my foes then see and be ashamed, because thou, Lord, dost help and comfort me. Psalm 87 Among the holy mountains high is his foundation fast, there seated in his sanctuary his temple there is placed. Zion's fair gates the Lord loves more than all the dwellings fair of Jacob's land, though there be store, and all within his care. City of God, most glorious things of thee abroad are spoke. I mention Egypt, where proud kings did our forefathers yoke. I mention Babel to my friends, Philistia full of scorn, and Tyre with Ethiop's utmost ends. Lo, this man there was born. But twice that praise shall in our ear be said of Zion last. This and this man was born in her. I, God, shall fix her fast. The Lord shall write it in a scroll that ne'er shall be outworn when he the nations doth enroll, that this man there was born. Both they who sing and they who dance with sacred songs are there. In thee fresh brooks and soft streams glance, and all my fountains clear. Psalm 88 Lord God, that dost me save and keep, all day to thee I cry, and all night long before thee weep, before thee prostrate lie. Into thy presence let my prayer with sighs devout ascend, and to my cries that ceaseless are thine ear with favour bend. For cloyed with woes and trouble store surcharged my soul doth lie. My life at death's uncheerful door under the grave draws nigh. Reckoned I am with them that pass down to the dismal pit. 
I am a man, but weak, alas, and for that name unfit. From life discharged and parted quite among the dead to sleep, and like the slain in bloody fight that in the grave lie deep, whom thou rememberest no more, dost never more regard, them from thy hand delivered o'er, death's hideous house hath barred. Thou in the lowest pit profound hast set me all forlorn, where thickest darkness hovers round, in horrid deeps to mourn. Thy wrath, from which no shelter saves, full sore doth press on me. Thou breakst upon me all thy waves, and all thy waves break me. Thou dost my friends from me estrange, and makest me odious, me to them odious, for they change, and I here pent up thus. Through sorrow and affliction great mine eye grows dim and dead. Lord, all the day I thee entreat, my hands to thee I spread. Wilt thou do wonders on the dead? Shall the deceased arise and praise thee from their loathsome bed with pale and hollow eyes? Shall they thy loving kindness tell, on whom the grave hath hold, or they who in perdition dwell thy faithfulness unfold? In darkness can thy mighty hand or wondrous acts be known, thy justice in the gloomy land of dark oblivion? But I to thee, O Lord, do cry, ere yet my life be spent, and up to thee my prayer doth high each morn and thee prevent. Why wilt thou, Lord, my soul forsake, and hide thy face from me, that am already bruised and shake with terror sent from thee, bruised and afflicted, and so low as ready to expire, while I thy terrors undergo, astonished with thine ire? Thy fierce wrath over me doth flow, Thy threatenings cut me through. All day they round about me go, Like waves they me pursue. Lover and friend thou hast removed And severed from me far. They fly me now, whom I have loved, And as in darkness are. Finis Collection of Passages Translated in the Prose Writings from Of Reformation in England, 1641. Our Constantine, of how much ill was cause, not thy conversion, but those rich domains that the first wealthy pope received of thee. Dante Inferno, 19, 115. Founded in chaste and humble poverty, gainst them that raised thee dost thou lift thy horn, impudent whore? Where hast thou placed thy hope? In thy adulterers, or thy ill-got wealth? Another Constantine comes not in haste. Petrarca, Sonnet 108 And, to be short, at last his guide him brings into a goodly valley, where he sees a mighty mass of things strangely confused, things that on earth were lost or were abused. Then passed he to a flowery mountain green, which once smelt sweet, now stinks as odiously. This was that gift, if you the truth will have, that Constantine to good Silvestro gave. Ariosto Orlando Furioso, 34, 80. From Reason of Church Government, 1641. When I die, let the earth be rolled in flame. From Apology for Smectimnus, 1642. Laughing to teach the truth what hinders, as some teachers give to boys junkets and knacks, that they may learn apace. Horace, Satire 1, line 24. Jesting decides great things, stronglier and better oft than earnest can. Ibid, Book 1, Satire 10, line 14. "'Tis you that say it, not I. "'You do the deeds, and your ungodly deeds find me the words.'" Sophocles, Electra, 624. From Areopagitica, 1644. "'This is true liberty, 
when free-born men having to advise the public may speak free which he who can and will deserves high praise who neither can nor will may hold his peace what can be juster in a state than this euripides suppliants four thirty eight from tetracordon sixteen forty five whom do we count a good man whom but he who keeps the laws and statutes of the senate who judges in great suits and controversies whose witness and opinion wins the cause but his own house and the whole neighbourhood see his foul inside through his whited skin horace epistles book one number sixteen line forty from the tenure of kings and magistrates sixteen forty nine there can be slain no sacrifice to god more acceptable than an unjust and wicked king seneca hercules furent nine twenty two from history of britain sixteen seventy brutus thus addresses diana in the country of leogesia goddess of shades and huntress who at will walkst on the rolling sphere and through the deep on thy third reign the earth look now and tell what land what seat of rest thou bidst me seek what certain seat where i may worship thee for a with temples vowed and virgin choirs to whom sleeping before the altar diana in a vision that night thus answered brutus far to the west in the ocean wide beyond the realm of gaul a land there lies sea girt it lies where giants dwelt of old now void it fits thy people thither bend thy course there shalt thou find a lasting seat there to thy sons another troy shall rise and kings be born of thee whose dreaded might shall awe the world and conquer nations bold end of miscellaneous poems end of milton's minor poems